All right, we are live. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to join, and then we will fire this puppy off. I'm already jumping to 28. Look at that. We don't have to wait very long. Already about 27 more than I expected, so. <laughs> <laughs> Such uplifting comment. I know, I know, right? Oh, All right. Well, we'll let we got we got some people we got some eyeballs on the set, so we're going to start it up now. There's no point to wait because we got a lot of content to get into. So, all right, coming down in three, two, one. That's right, bear down, Bears fans. It's time for another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast, Bears Banter, powered by Windy City Gridiron and SB Nation. Bill Zimmerman with you, and we are live here on a Monday night for a very special edition, a Chicago Bears mock off season. The Bears have been the talk of the NFL this entire off season. Before the off season started, they've been the talk of the NFL with of course the number one and number nine picks, plenty of cap space. So we are going to go through it all and try and decipher what the Chicago Bears might do. So we put together an expert panel, the best <laughs> in the business, they are, of course, Aaron Lemming from Bear Report and Windy City Gridiron. Aaron, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm looking Absolutely. forward to this. Thank you for joining us. We've got Brad Spielberger from Pro Football Focus, of course, the cap expert and free agency guru. Brad, thanks for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, of course, last but not least, EJ Snyder, the, the draft the, the man who knows what's going to happen before the teams know what's going to happen in the NFL draft, <laughs> EJ Snyder from Bootleg Football and Windy City Gridiron as well. EJ, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. This is a great panel. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. We've got a lot to get into. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to combine basically four months of off-season NFL work, try and get it done in about two hours here. We've got, we're going to evaluate the roster. We're going to examine where the holes are. We're going to evaluate free agency. Of course, the, the Bears free agents and, and who they should resign, who they should let walk. Free agency, we're going to let Brad's expertise in terms of contracts and how to slot those into the salary cap. We'll lean on EJ for the NFL draft and what might happen there. If there's trades that need to happen in the draft, before the draft, we'll talk about them. We'll try and look at what's the most objective way to get things done, something that would work for both teams. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to go through this. So, of course, as NFL teams do, and, and we're going to, and I should say this, you know, we'll talk about what we think the Bears are going to try and do. We'll emulate what we think the Bears are going to try and do. But, you know, this is a lot of what we think the Bears should do as well. So this isn't us trying to project everything the Chicago Bears are going to do. This is, you know, kind of a, a, an all-encompassing using everyone's expertise about what would be good paths for the Bears to take, whether it's free agency or the draft. So, of course, the first thing NFL teams do is they start with the evaluation of their current roster. So, of course, let's go through that. We're going to go through the defense, then we'll go through the offense. Let's start in the defensive backfield, guys. Let's start with safeties. And, and I'm going to look at this. I think this one is, is pretty straightforward here. I know there's, you know, Johnson and, and Elijah Hicks and guys like that. But, I, you know, they, they Eddie Jackson's no longer here. They need someone to start opposite Brisker. And they need, to me, a reliable backup, someone that if, if one of these guys goes down, that you feel comfortable with. So, so, Aaron, I'll start with you. I think this team needs another starting safety and a reliable backup for the 2024 season. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I think uh, obviously starting safety is going to be a big one. Kind of talked about it a little bit before. There's a lot of names out there, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a Geno Stone. Um, you know, I know that seems to be a Bears fan favorite, uh, Jordan Fuller. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Blackman. I mean, there's there's a, there's a lot of different names, but I do think one of the more important things, at least for me, obviously starting, you know, starting safety is important. But I think one of the more important things to me, you've got to get a better third safety than Elijah Hicks, man. Like, We've seen how often Brisker goes down. We saw how often Eddie Jackson went down. Like, you've got to have better depth there. EJ? Yeah, even when they're not going down, there's a lot of three defensive back, three safety packages in the NFL. It's a very common defense. It is probably the third most common structure set league-wide is playing three safeties. And interestingly enough, when we were talking to some 
cornerback prospects at Shrine Bowl this year, we said, hey, you know, some people are talking about you, Nickel. Some people are talking about you as a safety. Do you care? And this was Jerry and Jones from FSU. And he said one of the, you know, smartest things I've heard all offseason. He said, coaches don't want to play two safeties. They want to play one safety and four corners. So you can call me whatever you want, but I'm a defensive back and I'm fully happy to do it because with all the match quarter stuff in the NFL, it's all man after a couple of seconds anyways. So you got to be able to play. And they, the, those guys don't really get hung up on I'm a nickel, I'm a star, I'm a safety, I'm a dimebacker. They, the Bears need defensive backs. And when you look at the current depth of safety, it's really light. So, yes, I would say two, a starter, and as everybody else has said, a very reliable backup. Any difference of opinion, Brad? I was going to say maybe kick this back to EJ, but I think it's also an important spot in free agency because it is not perceived as a good draft class at the position whatsoever. So, um, you know, always depth in free agency. There's a top end guys. I don't think they're going to get the top, top of the market. Your, you know, Xavier McKinney's, your Cameron Curls, who I think at around 12, 13 million per year. But there's a ton of quality depth options at the position, as there always are. Uh, and I think they should be, you know, in, in the mix there. I know Brad Biggs mentioned Jordan Fuller out in uh, LA. There's the Matty Bufus connection, Julian Blackman, who, who was playing a totally different role this past year, which I found interesting. Coming down in the box, roving, uh, had a couple nice interceptions. Previously, it had been like a pure deep third ball hawk. So, yeah, a lot of different pieces. And I think they need to add one of them probably in, in a week from today or close to it. All right. Uh, I think I think we're all pretty much in agreement there on the need. So let, let's move over to cornerback here. Uh, Brad, I'm going to we'll, we'll switch direction. I'll start with you here. I mean, I mean, look, this one's pretty obvious. They've got a lot of nice pieces here, e even in further down in the depth. If, if you want to talk about guys like Josh Blackwell, but but their top four corners, I think, are very good. Top four corners, meaning presumably Jalen Johnson is back, whether that be on the franchise tag or an extension. Uh, I, I do think that is pretty much a lock at this point. So I, I don't think there is much to do here at corner other than making sure that Jalen Johnson is a bear in 2024. Yeah. And I think we will get a franchise tag before, you know, tomorrow's 4 PM deadline for the tags. Uh, I think that will happen. Obviously the team that has until July to get a multi-year deal done. Um, but yeah, I, I would be surprised if that deadline is beat uh, with an extension before then. EJ, Aaron, any anything here on on corners that you feel? Because like I said, this is this is a solid group. There's not a lot that Bears need to do here in 2024. I think you know before midpoint of the season last year, it would have been a need. The young guys developed really nicely in the last half of the season. It was a almost a tale of two seasons. Tyreek Stevenson, Terrell Smith, in particular, really came on. And that is a great luxury for the Bears to have two picks from the same draft class come on at a position that is a priority and also a need really gives them a lot of flexibility. And this is a pretty solid corner draft. There's a very big amount of, of corners that can play and start, but they don't need to dip into that pool. They don't need to spend picks there. And that's a tremendous luxury going into the draft. The only thing I really had to ask is this is actually towards Brad because you're the contract guy. What do you think, uh, what do you think Jalen Johnson market is now? Cause it seemed like, I think it was what back in a few months ago, I think you had him in like 18, 19 million. I would assume that that's probably what 2021 now. I think at this point you're trying to top Jair Alexander, become the highest paid corner in the NFL. Um, if you're him, I think that's where you're starting at this point. You're 24. Yeah. You'll be 25 at week one next year, but you know, that that's part of it. And then the rest of the free agent class, you know, once the Jerry Sneed gets tagged, I mean, there's not much there. It's older players. It's third contract guys. It's unproven young players. So I think if you're sitting there, if you're him, you're just like, I'm by far the best option. If I was going to hit the market, someone else is going to pay me, I don't know, 22, 23. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it depends now, like, by how much or in what metrics do they make him the highest paid corner, quote unquote. Um, but it's going to be in some, if I had to guess, if he's going to sign that dotted line. Let me ask you one more, Brad, before we move on to the next position group on Jalen. And that is kind of a summer extension 2023 versus where we are now. I think Ryan Poles has done a pretty darn good job evaluating guys and, and knowing when to pay, when to wait. This one seemed to have bitten bit him kind of in the rear here. And it seems like he may, you know, the they may, bears may have cost themselves five or six million. I don't know if it's that high, but five or six million per year. What do you think? So the summer is interesting, or going back to last offseason, because he fired a very well-known, established, successful, quality agent. Um, I won't throw names in here. I might allude to these people. It's not relevant. But it hired kind of a more unproven, you know, newer guy to the market. I'm not saying anything is good or bad in that regard, but that to me signals he thought he should get more from the team. 
And obviously even his agent, maybe to a degree, was kind of trying to manage his expectations and, and him and Jalen didn't see eye to eye. So I think the bigger miss, and again, we don't know, but may have hypothetically been around the deadline before that first you know trade request. I think the offseason was probably not very close. He'd miss time and, and yada, yada. So yeah, anyway, I, I think it more tied to the middle of the season. And again, maybe we're wrong, but I think that's where the miss may have been. All right. Well, I, th- I think we're there. We, we know what we need with corner and safety, which isn't too much, but obviously they need to add a little bit at safety. So let's move on to the linebackers. And for me, this is a group that probably doesn't need anything. I mean, obviously they're going to need some some bottom of the, the roster guys. We're not going to worry about whether Dylan Cole should come back to play special teams, whether Mike or, Micah Baskerville should make the 53 this year. For, for me, I look at this group, and obviously Edwards and Edmonds are two guys that are going to be patrolling. If they go three backers, they've got Sanborn to come in at Sam. He's also a solid backup for either of those two guys. And, you know, we'll see what they have. Maybe Noah Sewell gets a little more of a run this year. It's not a position I'm worried about. EJ, we'll start with you this time. Any any concerns with linebacker for this year? No, they spent big on linebacker last year. Uh, again, in the first half of the year, the defense had – Lots of troubles. They're well chronicled in the back half of the year. They were creeping up to a top five in the league unit in terms of DVOA overall. They really came together, started playing well. Love Sanborn as a depth piece. If there's any quote unquote need at linebacker here, it's going to be in one of their very last picks as like a special teamer, a guy like Trevin Wallace from Kentucky who can really run, who's built, who's going to be down in the you know, late 100s or early 200s if they pick up another pick just to to add a body. It's always good to have, but there's no like crying need. They could they could roll into the season today with what they have and be very competitive. All right. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I've really got nothing to add to that. I, I think they're pretty, pretty, pretty well set. Uh, anything, Brad? Not a. Yeah. All right. So that this is a position we're going to basically unless something wild is sitting there in the draft this is something that we are going to be ignoring uh for this offseason because like ej said they spent a lot already so let's move over to the defensive line because this this is a little trickier i think this might 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 be a little bit more of a debate let's start over on the edge side let's keep demarcus walker over at edge we can talk about him as as a d tackle as well with his his position flexibility to me I, you know, you got to kind of combine these because I think it's an either or. You're not going to spend big at two positions. I do wonder if the Bears are going to spend big at all, meaning guys pushing over $20 million a year. I just don't know. I think Ryan Poles may kind of continue with the, the middle of the road pieces. So as much as I would love Chris Jones, as much as I would love Christian Wilkins, I don't think the Bears are going to throw their hats in the ring there. Um I do think they need a big disruptor in the middle. I like Jervon Dexter, but I don't see Jervon Dexter as a game wrecker. That's the big thing for me. And over at the edge position, yeah, they need some pass rush opposite opposite Montez Sweat. I think that's clear. But to me, if you have a pass rush with Montez Sweat and someone collapsing the pocket regularly, I think that opens up the door for as good of a pass rush I don't think the Bears can address everything on this defensive line. We know how bad it was and how much better it got with sweat. They're definitely going to add some pieces here, Aaron. But, you know, if we start kind of focusing on edge, Demarcus Walker, I think, is an okay third edge. He might have to be a second edge if you need to play, if you pay D tackle. But if you pay edge, then you can have Walker play more in the middle. I like the position flexibility there. But, Dominique Robinson is is not anyone to rely on if he even makes the 53 this year. So there's not a lot of depth here. Rasheem Green, there's no reason to bring him back in my eyes. Not a lot of depth here at edge. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think ultimately I think they need a edge two and probably an edge four at this point. I mean, saying Dominique Robinson, I mean, let's, let's be honest. I mean, the, the guy produced at the well below average level. I mean, he doesn't really have a spot on the roster and he should have a spot on the roster. So – I see. I tend to because I look at the defensive line, and I think in an ideal world, I think you can kind of look at this and say, okay, you know, let's get another three tech, let's get another big disruptor in the middle, but let's also go out and let's land, you know, a, a top end edge rusher. Unfortunately, I don't think that they're going to have the resources or want to spend the resources in order for that to happen. So I think in this sort of situation for me, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, hey, you know, you got the free agent market. If you don't want to go out and spend twenty plus million dollars a year, go out and sign a guy like Bryce up, right? Then he can go in the draft. You can draft somebody in the second or third round if they get a second round pick. If not, the third round. 
I think that that's kind of more the route that you're going to have to take at this point, because ultimately when you're looking at the offensive side of the ball, which obviously we'll get to, I think a lot more of the resources on the off season need to go to that. And they need to stop building so much on the defense. So that's kind of where I'm at. I know that's kind of a little bit of a shallow take, but I would, I would definitely lean edge rusher over interior at this point. What about you, EJ? I'm, I'm with both of you in one way that they're not going to be able to spend big at both positions. They do need help at both positions and they could use top end talent at both positions, but they are, let's just call them primary pay positions, especially at edge. It's a top dollar position, three tech only slightly less, uh, especially if you're getting a truly dedicated interior pass rusher. We get into the draft. There's some interesting names that are a little bit farther down that you're not going to have to spend premium draft capital on that can get you some interior pass rush in this draft. That's one strategy teams teams do this. Brad will tell you they'll balance, right? They'll look at the free agency listing, look at the money they have and go, well, yeah, but there's four guys between 80 and hundred that we think we could bring in that would make a difference. Let's sort of pencil in that we'll aim that way pre-draft and yeah, let's go get an edge because we really don't think we're going to be able to get an edge up high with the picks we have. So if we want an impact edge rusher, we'll do that in free agency. That'll be our splash. And then we'll try and build some interior pass rush depth through the draft or vice versa, depending on what they want. But I'm with you. I don't think the Bears can take a big swing at both. I don't, you know, they quote unquote have the cap, but Brad will tell you about the difference between cap and cash. And it would take a lot in escrow and guarantees to put two of those guys on the roster early, say in the first week of free agency, it'd be nice, but I don't see that happening. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, I'll agree with, with, with both of y'all. I think the way it lines up too, is just that there's the, the marquee, you know, the Christian Wilkins, Justin Medi BKs who are going to get uh, absurd money. And then the next tier of guys on, uh, in terms of free agency and interior defender are more like your zero one tech run stuff or type. I mean, they have pass for upside, but I'm thinking you go cheaper there. We're going to connect Eric Washington, the new Bears defense coordinator, to a bunch of people tonight. But to me, like Daquan Jones is a great three to five tech veteran, um, can, can get up field in a hurry, can just one gap and and get up field. And I think you have two guys in Billings and, and Dexter that can push the pocket. And, and frankly, to me, Dexter still profiles more as like a one tech, but that's a whole different, different conversation <laughs> for a different day. But anyway, um, and then I think the, the bigger splash could maybe be edge rusher where – on the flip side, you mentioned Bryce Huff, Aaron. I think Jonathan Grenard, like measurables and everything wise, is probably kind of a darling in, in Matty Refluse. And, and, you know, Ryan pulls his eyes. He has like 35 inch arms. He's good against the run. He's a true three down player, all that stuff. But even below that tier, there are still some solid football players that I think make a, make a lot of sense at edge. So if I had to guess the one spot, they maybe make a splash. And again, we're not talking Brian Burns, we're not talking Josh Allen, but splash in so far as. 14 to 19, 14 to 18 million per year. I think it would be edge defender for this team. All right. And and while we're here, let's let's kind of look at these defensive tackles with, with this team. I know we kind of combined it here a little bit. Um, I, I know you guys are talking about Dexter as the one tech. I get that. I don't see Zach Pickens as a one tech, but he's there <laughs> a lot. So this is this is what they've decided to do. Um, I don't think spending on one tech. You know, makes a lot of sense uh, with, with Andrew Billings. He had an excellent year, uh, especially for what they paid him. They're bringing him back for uh, on a two year extension. I li like I said, I like Dexter. I don't know if Dexter is ever going to be a game record, but I do think he's going to be an above average player, a solid addition to the middle. Um, so so overall, when I'm looking at this thing, you know, like I said, I would want if I had a priority here, I would want to go for a, a, a Wilkins type. That would be my top priority. But at the same time, if you're not spending on that, when you look at the second tier down, I do think edge provides a lot better in terms of those type of players. So if we're sitting there, if we're, we're, we're eliminating the Christian Wilkins and, and the Chris Jones and that level of a, of a three tech, if we're eliminating them, then I would absolutely agree with you guys that spending on an edge and, and you know, I'll just drop the name Bryce Huff here. Now we'll talk about it more when we get to kind of a free agency plan, because I know bears fans love him. They've loved him since August when I think it was Brad who may have put it out on Twitter yeah. about Bryce. It was Huff. absolutely and, Brad. And it started yeah. with everyone going who, and by, you know, two days later, everyone was like, we got to have this guy. So, you know, and he again performed very well in his limited opportunities in a, in a crowded Jets defensive line. So does anyone have anything else to add here in terms of, interior defenders, you know, certain holes. I, I think 
you know, you know, Justin Jones, you know, assuming he's not here, they, they do need another defensive tackle piece to go with the three they have. And, and we've talked about it, a couple different edges spending and potentially in the draft. Uh, anyone have any difference of opinion there? No, I think this is kind of a balancing act at this point. You're not going to be able to take care of everything. So figure it out the best you can and go from there. All right. Um, so let's move over to the offensive side of the ball. And since we're in the trenches, let's stay in the trenches. Um, I know if the Bears don't acquire a certain position, EJ is just going to hand in his Bears card and I think move to Wisconsin and become a Packers fan. Uh, nope. And that- nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Not happening. I might move to a cabin in the woods and stop watching football, but it is center. The Bears need a center. I was a huge proponent. Folks that follow my work knew that I was absolutely 100% convinced looking at the Bears roster, they could not proceed with only Lucas Patrick at center. The Bears obviously saw that very differently. They thought that was going to work. I was shocked by that approach, and we saw how it played out. Uh, A lot of their offense was wrecked from interior pressure. Lucas Patrick played very, very poorly, well below average. And the Bears, like, flat out, Ryan Poles is a former offensive lineman. He, He understands this. They need a pivot in the middle. And I don't care how they get it. There's a couple of good ones in free agency. We'll talk about them now. There's a couple of good ones in the draft. You're going to have to go up higher to get them. Brad and I go back and forth about whether or not this is quote unquote worth it from draft capital, but that's, <laughs> that's nerding out from a, from a hardcore perspective. I don't care. The bears need a center coming out of this off season needs to be starting caliber period. End of story. I'm not interested in anything else. I'll Aaron? just say this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go, ahead, go, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Brad. Yeah. I'll just jump in. I'll just jump in. I, I heard my name come up and I, 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 I had this <laughs> I poll for EJ. Name. This is just for you, EJ. Cause I know you've been, you know, very flustered by the Bears approach that I saw, as a lot mm. of fans have. I was looking last year's free agency at the center position. The highest ranking on my free agent board and the highest paid player uh, was the 174th free agent, Nick Gates, was the mm. highest ranked center to actually change teams because you had Ethan Poachers go back to Cleveland, mm-hmm. Connor McGovern go to the Jets. He was a disaster for New York this past year. Garrett Bradbury to go to Minnesota. Bradley Bozeman go back to Carolina. Coleman Shelton, who we'll get to in a second, go back to the Rams. And then you have Nick Gates, the biggest, you know, name at center to change teams. FYI, he was cut this week after one year of a three-year deal. So the beauty is this year, the free agent market is loaded at center. I mentioned Coleman Shelton because he played for Shane Waldron with the LA Rams. Evan Brown was the center this past year in Seattle. And you also have much bigger names like a Lloyd Cushenberry in Denver, and Andre James with the Raiders, uh, you know Aaron Brewer with Tennessee, who obviously has familiarity with, with with Nate Davis. There's probably names I'm forgetting. I think this year they see it the same way. Last year was a disaster. I also <laughs> think they want to pair a rookie quarterback with a veteran center. I think if they're going to make a splash, quote unquote, it's center, so not a splash, but a big signing on offense. I would guess it's probably going to be center. You you agree with that, Aaron? Yeah, no, I, I I'm I'm right there. Uh, I think that yeah, center makes the most sense. Um, but I am curious too, because I mean, obviously, center is the the main focus. But I'm curious where all of you guys sit, because it seems like left tackle is kind of one of those like people either like Braxton Jones or they don't. It's almost like Charles Leno Jr. all over again. It's just funny because it feels like they're very similar players. So where do you guys sit in that? They, Charles, obviously, you know, they're not going to go free agency. You know, where do you guys sit with that? For, for me personally, I think Braxton Jones should remain. I understand that this tackle class is loaded, and it would be awesome to get one of these guys. You know, I don't think Joe Alt's going to be sitting there at nine, but if he is, and if, if Joe Alt and Roma Dunze are somehow both sitting there at nine, that, that is an impossible decision to make. And again, I don't think that's going to be the case, so that, that's okay. But for me, when I look at this offensive line, Braxton Jones, you have two more years of control with Braxton Jones for what I would consider to be an average tackle. Mm -hmm. I think that's tremendous. Uh, I I would not, you know, and the fact that you found that in the fifth round, I'm not worried about trying to get a tackle. If the Bears had more of a complete team where they could actually be looking at upgrading positions instead of filling holes, we'd have a completely different conversation where someone like Braxton Jones is, is a replaceable level player. But I I look at this and go, they don't have a center. They don't have any interior depth because Jatiree Carter has certainly fallen off in terms of a depth piece there. You know, I know that the two centers that I know EJ was alluding to is Zach Frazier and JPJ. I don't see any way you can get those guys if you're the Chicago Bears. I think, you know, that 20 to 
35, 40 range is where those guys are going to go. And I just, I don't see the Bears, unless they trade back from nine significantly, I, I don't see a way for them to land in the range to get a guy like that. And I don't think you can rely on that in March when you need to sign free agents. So so for me, I'm with all you guys. I think they need to spend at center. And we'll, we'll, we can talk about the depth here as kind of a round two around the offensive line. But it's spend at center and it's leave Braxton Jones alone and focus on some other holes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, back to Braxton Jones. Let's not make a hole where we don't have one. Braxton Jones is a serviceable player, and I think he's going to look much better with some stability on the offensive line off to his right. That is a very typical result, especially for young offensive linemen. When they try and do too much, when they try and do a job and a half because everything's falling apart to the inside, they end up looking not great. He still looked pretty good despite all that occurring. So Let's not make a hole where we don't have one because, as we were just talking about on the defense, they don't have a safety or two. They don't have an edge rusher or two. They don't have a penetrating three tech. Like, there are plenty of holes here. Let's not make one for what is an average player, but that's serviceable. Spend to get center. I see a lot of love for Graham Barton in the chat. I appreciate that. Bears are not getting Graham Barton unless something weird happens with their picks because right now, without – any picks, and we'll talk about this as we go forward. There's a large gap between 9 and 75, and all the guys we're talking about, JPJ, Frazier, and Barton are all going in that range. So unless they move up from their current picks or gather some extra picks in that range, and it's going to be higher than you think because this happened last year. The centers went off the board more quickly than all of us thought. Some of the centers in last year's draft we thought were great. We thought they were top of the fourth round players. Maybe the Bears get them at the end of the third. They went in the second, like – these players are going to go off the board at a premium and the bears aren't going to have a shot at those guys. So if Cushionberry's sitting there and they can pay him again, that balancing act, Hey, knock that one off on free agency, leave it alone in the draft, put those resources towards things we need. Cause there's certainly plenty of those. Brad, anything on the starting five? No, we're on the same page. We're going to again get into it, but I think the key is adding swing tackle and a swing guard. So no, the starting five, I'm, I'm good with though. All right, so let, let's uh, – I think all of us agree they need another depth piece along the offensive line, either that's spending kind of on a, a third, fourth round guard center flexibility guy or, you know, potentially getting – I think they probably should try and get a cheaper veteran, you know, a, a better version of Dan Feeney in essence at, at guard and center. Something like that would make sense. But let's talk about Larry Borum for a second because I, I know ahead of time EJ talked about this as something that he's he's uncomfortable with Larry Borum as our as the Chicago Bears swing tackle. I do understand that sentiment, and EJ, I'll, I'll bounce back to you here after this. But to me, what I would do if if they if you want to try and take another swing at a Braxton Jones type tackle in round five that can be your swing in competition with Larry Borum. I don't think Larry Borum needs to be cut. I think Larry Borum is perfectly acceptable mm -hmm. on a 53 man roster. And if you have four tackles on your 53, I don't think that's a problem and have Borum and potentially a fifth round rookie in competition for the swing position. Yeah. I, I think Larry Borum is one of those players that a lot of us were excited about because of the lack of talent surrounding him and thought, Hey, he's pretty good compared to, uh, nothing. He's a lot better than that. As the talent level has risen, the Bears have invested in Darnell Wright. He's a player that looks really good until you have to play him. And then you play him and you go, oh, wait, that's a pretty significant drop off. And that's the case for a lot of NFL teams. Not a ton of NFL teams have a great third tackle. Tackles are at a shortage. Does that mean you just leave him? No, that means exactly you do exactly what you said, Billy. You go get competition. You don't just cut the guy and send him. You say, hey, let's see if we can find another lottery ticket in the you know the bottom of the fourth, the middle of the fifth, a developmental piece that can come in, work with our offensive line coach, and see if he can be that swing tackle. Because I think they need one because obviously if Braxton or Darnell go down, there is a tremendous drop off and you end up having, you know, the weakest link thing happen again on your offensive line. And we've all seen what happens to the bears when that happens. So it's a need, but it's not one of those primary needs and you end up balancing it. Brad, how would you address offensive line depth? Yeah. For, for the swing tackle, I think again, you probably, you know, you can go late round. Of course, they've obviously taken a lot of dart throws in, you know, the four, fifth to seventh on, on a lot of offensive line talent. But I think you also, again, look in free agency and, and try to address that spot and just see if you can kind of close the door on that potential issue. 
George Fant may be priced out a little bit, but I think is a very capable swing tackle. Played a right tackle this past year for the Houston Texans. Cam Fleming uh, was in Denver this past year, has been a bunch of places, New England, a couple others, also a capable swing tackle. You know, And then, wait, how can we forget our old pal, Cornelius Lucas, also a pending free agent? So, you know, I, I, think it, I think it's meaningful. I think it matters a lot. And all three of those guys can play both sides. Um, I, I think it's not a priority per se, but – you know, offensive linemen get hurt, so why don't I have a good a good swing tackle ready to go? You had me until Lucas, Brad. You did. I was <laughs> with you. I was like, "Yep, yep." What? Our old pal? Oh, come <laughs> on. Well, come on. Yeah. Pal might be generous, but you know, there's some interesting <laughs> options in the draft too. We just saw guys like Rod, uh, Rosengarten from UW, who's right up the road for me, have tremendous athletic testing again, and he actually his. People are going to dig into his passing numbers now because of his athletic testing and go, oh, wait, he was actually protecting Penix's blind side as a left-handed quarterback and didn't give up more than a handful of pressures. Like, he, he was a good player. So uh, he's going to climb a little bit. Guys like Dominic Cooney, who have, you know, a lot of versatility are going to be down there. We'll see how quickly they go. It, it's an interesting way, I think, uh, the first two names, again, that Brad mentioned in free agency, again, if you get to that second wave and nobody's jumping at those guys, absolutely bring in the competition for a reasonable rate. Why not? They're experienced. We know they can play. Well, I feel like I'm kind of taking taking Brad's role here a little bit, but I was looking on over the cap just to kind of get an idea, and Larry Borms to be making almost $3.2 million. So it's like you mentioned a guy like a George fan or one of these veterans. I, I mean, again, Brad, you're going to have a better idea than I do, but it, it seems like the price to upgrade may not be as much as you would think, considering what that 3.2 is basically non-guaranteed, much like it was this last year with Travis Gibson and Kendall Vildor. So I, I'm i kind of there, too. I, I know a lot of people, for some odd reason during the season, wanted to debate the fact that he was just as good as, uh, as Braxton Jones. I don't see that being the case whatsoever. I think he's replaceable um, at best. And I think if you can get a more quality veteran, especially at swing tackle, I think it makes sense. But I do think that they need to put a little bit more value on the interior um, this year, especially with the depth. I mean, it's cool that they traded, what was that, a six or seventh round pick for Dan Feeney, and then he didn't basically he played what like 15 snaps that was that was kind of a waste but yeah I, I think you're kind of getting to that point within this rebuild where you're looking at this and you say okay you know we don't need to have every single every single guy in the offensive line doesn't need to be this young up and coming guy like you can go out and you can get a veteran but I think you're kind of getting to that point especially with the rookie quarterback where you're going to want better depth than what you've had over the last few years real quick right. just jump go, in go ahead Brad yeah, I just want to, because we'll get contract nerdy for a second here. Uh, the Larry Borum shot's great. It, what happened is he earned the proven performance escalator, where you earn a raise to your fourth-year salary if you play a certain amount of snaps, in his case, uh, is why he got it boosted to the lowest restricted free agent tender. So the Bears are going to say, hey, Larry, we don't want to pay you three mil. You're going to have to take a pay cut, basically back down to where it started. Um, either he can say yes to that, or they, they already cut him. But I'd be shocked if he is actually paid that, that salary. All right, so before we move over to skill position players, uh, Aaron brought this up in our, our pre-show meetings. Special teams, I didn't have that on the rundown. We should talk about that a little bit. Obviously, Cairo Santos is is here for the, the semi-long haul with his new contract. I know Patrick Scales is a free agent. I assume they're going to bring Patrick Scales back if they want to play around at, at, at um, you know, long snapper. I'm not going to pretend to have a good idea of what direction they should go, but let's talk about punter because I, I think Trenton Gill, um, and I think partially because of EJ Snyder's show on Windy City Gridiron, is is a very popular punter for someone that hasn't had wild success oh, at the punting position. So, Brad, well, let's start with you here. Is there any reason to actually invest in punter at this point in the off season, or I'm sorry, at this point in the rebuild, I should say, to me, this is a bring in a UDFA rookie that you think can compete with Trenton Gill and may the best man win. Yeah, it's probably the smart way to go about it, but I'm not opposed. Um, this might be a hot take. Like I think I'd rather spend on punter than kicker to a degree, unless you have a Justin Tucker or a Harrison Butker or whatever. I know I'm in the, the most like anti Cairo Santos guy around. I get it. He can make 40 yarders. Whoop de do. Um, but you know, like I, if you want to flip the field and yeah, see, I was just, yeah, I'm going to get yelled at now. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I'd rather just go UDFA and find a big leg, but like Tommy Townsend in Kansas city, um, you know, interesting situation there. They go out and sign Matt Areza, 
uh, maybe he comes free and, and you can just get a, a quality punt there. But I don't know. It, whatever they want to do. I'll, in, in polls, we trust. Uh, Aaron, you wanted to talk about it. I'll go to you next. Well, um, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and lay down the same gauntlet EJ did. If Patrick Scales ain't back, I'm not back. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> He's the glue to this team. He's going to be the team that leads us, uh, the guy that leads this team to the Super Bowl. Like, Patty Scales is the man. But, yeah, I, I feel like – it, it feels like at least last year, like I've always been a little hypercritical of Trenton Gill because I don't think he's really been that good. It felt like people were a little defensive, maybe because he was a draft pick, but it feels like there's a lot of decent options. Um, I don't know. I personally, I, and I know that Brad and I went back and forth to this when it happened. I'm totally cool with the Cairo Santos uh, <laughs> extension and I'm fine. It, dude, if they want to go out and they want to sign like a proven punter, I, I, I don't think that that's a bad idea at all. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm probably going to get a lot of crap for saying this, but I almost kind of like the idea. And I know they're low on picks, so I almost kind of like the idea of them spending like a fifth round pick on the uh, the, the Iowa punter. Like, I mean, as crazy as that sounds, I know that's crazy. I okay, know we're going to fight now, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. we're trapping now. We're <laughs> I know we're going to fight. We but... don't have picks for that. And you, you know the the strategy that the other guys laid out of bringing in a couple of UDFAs. There's always a couple of UDFA punters out there that have really big legs and it is a lot about pressure with all the kicking positions. Can they do it when the chips are down? Like Trenton Gill had a good first year and not a good second year. And so he absolutely needs some competition spending a pick on it. I'm like, no, wait, we're not doing that. But an upgrade free agency, like go for it. Trust for dress away. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was really cool. That was, that was really cool. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Talk about was, talk about was a good fun undrafted giveaway. free agents yeah. there, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, my, my only requirement if you bring in a UDFA is is he Australian? If he is, right. him in. or <laughs> Bill, uh, they had four guys this year in the international pathway pl- program from Ireland. Yeah. All footy guys are rugby players who are all kicking specialists who are in the international pathway program. I think there was like 13 or 18 guys named to that, and four of them were Irish kickers. So might be the next Australia. Go mine the new, you know, rich market. All right. So got a little more evaluation to do skill positions coming up next. So we're going to take a quick break for the podcast, folks. We'll be right back on the other side. Bears banter, Chicago Bears mock off season. We'll be back right after this. All right. Welcome back into the podcast as we continue the Chicago Bears mock off season with Brad Spielberger from Pro Football Focus, EJ Snyder from Windy City Gridiron and Bootleg Football, and Aaron Lemming from Bear Report and Windy City Gridiron as well. Bill Zimmerman with you. So guys, let's move into the skill position players. Let's start at tight end because I think this is a pretty interesting position. We know Cole Komet's there at the top of the list. Robert Tanyan, there is no chance he's going to be back in a Chicago Bears roster, but Mercedes Lewis is an interesting guy to talk about. So Aaron, let's start with you here and let's talk a little tight end. I think the Bears need a pass catching tight end that they can bring in in two tight end sets and a blocking tight end as well. Someone that can back up Colt Komet at the Y. Lewis is a guy that could still do that at, at even at his age or they could go to free agency or potentially the draft. How would you like them to address tight end depth? Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting, right? Because it feels like this year, more than a lot of years, it feels like they're going to put a little bit more value on that U tight end, right? They're, they're going to go out and they're going to want to spend, whether it's uh, maybe not a crazy high draft pick, because there's really only one, at least in my opinion, there's one really worthy tight end in the first round, right? And it's going to be Brock Bowers. I don't know how I feel about that. But, uh, you know, maybe somebody like no fan can make some sense. Like there, there are different options out there. Um, as far as the blocking tight end goes, I mean, Mercedes Lewis makes some sense. I kind of dove in a little bit. Uh, I think it was a few days ago when I was doing my mock off season and I'll be honest with you, you start getting through some of those names, you know, who is this guy? Like I just going on pro football focus, just looking at grades, just trying to figure out who some of these guys are. So, uh, I, I feel like EJ is going to have a really good answer to this. So, I, he just he looks locked and loaded, ready to go. I let's just put it this way: I think they need a a, a good pass catcher. Um, as far as what they do at blocking, I, I I don't think I know enough to to really say much on that yet. All right, EJ. Yeah, yeah there's EJ. there's a lot of options. It's going to be tough up high. Brock Bowers is going to go very high. He I don't believe will go in the top ten just because of the money. I think he deserves to go in the top ten as a player in terms of impact on the field. He is 
absolutely dynamic. I don't think that's necessarily the right move for the Bears, again, because they have multiple options uh, and multiple holes that they need to fill on the side of the ball. So that's just a pretty big swing that would be very costly. And Brad can talk about why the money doesn't make any sense. Um, JT Sanders is a very good option, but again, he's going to be in that sort of chasm where the bears don't have picks. It's probably going to be off the board before they get him. And then you sort of get into role player tight ends farther on down. And there's many of them. And a lot of them are good. When you flip over to the free agency side, a guy like Charlie Warner, I think it's a free agent. Is that correct, Brad? Out of San Francisco, right. the Niners. He might be yeah. an RFA. Keep the, keep and, going. I'll pull that up. And they, you know, he was a guy that I liked coming out uh, as a guy that I thought blocked very well and had a little bit of pass catching. But that's a great guy to have as your third tight end. I think Mercedes Lewis is still effective in the run game. Strangely, he's one of the oldest players in the league, but he is not at all effective in the pass game. So it'd be nice to get somebody that has at least a threat of that because otherwise you're tipping the hand of the defense of what you're doing. Like if you're bringing in Mercedes Lewis, guess what guys? It's a run. It's not a pass or it's max protect either way. I mean, they, they know at that point. So some pretty interesting options in the draft, but there's this huge chasm. It's, it's up top. It's Brock Bowers and JT Sanders. And then there's this massive drop to like one, 30 almost like when you start talking about Senate out of Kansas state and guys like that, or Devin Holker, uh, you know, those guys are down in the hundreds. So that's a massive drop in tight end. So you either get one up high or you just wait. Um, free agency is a bit of a different story. There's a lot of Waldron connections. Um, I'll let Brad talk about those for the most part. Fans there. Colby Parkinson was a favorite of mine. He also played with him in Seattle. He Love would be that. a nice role player. So there's a lot of people drawing lines between those guys naturally. So again, there's, there's a balance here. You can get one from, you know, one of Fant or Parkinson and then pick one in the draft and, and mix and match. But I, do the bears do need to do that. Komet progressed a lot in the second half of the season, but there's literally nothing behind it right now. Brad. Yeah, you forgot about my favorite, maybe the biggest my guy of the offseason at tight end, which a uh, story, story came out today that he massages cows in the offseason for his hand strength, his grip strength. Uh, that's Cade Stover at Ohio State, who I think is your backup in line. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. That's a real story. I'm not making that up. I, I um, Yes. And if you're like, if, if your tight end is not massaging cows, I'm like, what's like, what are you doing? What are we even uh, doing here? Yeah, like, what are you doing? Like, you're wasting everyone's time. Uh, so... Yeah, I think Noah Fant is really the only big name free agent I would be interested in. I, I still believe in the talent. You still see some run after the catch ability, um, some very, very enticing upside. Kobe Parkinson also, you said his name. I just had a hot flash because he should be on my free agent board, and he is not. Um, <laughs> which is a, yeah, that's an oversight. That's a miss. I, that's a miss I, was, right I was wondering about that. I was actually wondering about it. I was going to ask you offline about that. but I'm glad Yeah, I'm no, it's just a flat out, flat out miss. So he'll be just on it. There's some people there, who actually uh, prefer prefer him over Noah Fant. Well, it'd be cheaper. You know, I have Noah Fant at three years, twenty four mil, which might even be a little bit bullish. Um, I couldn't get much intel intel on him in Indy. Um, I, I think there's it'll he'll do decently. He's young. He has the, the draft capital. Obviously, as a former first round pick, and there's really nothing beyond. You know, I think Dalton Schultz finally gets a decent deal, and then after those two, it's like your third contracting for. Hunter Henry, Gerald Everett, Austin Hooper type players that are, I think, going to get not much. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to how they address that spot because it is not a very strong position in either market. Um, I, I'm all in on Fant if they want to do it because I think the price, you know, might be might be right where you get three year deal for decent money and then it looks like a value just because you're untapping some of the potential there. All right. I think we're all in agreement on kind of where they need to go. We'll talk about how to address it here as we get to, you know, Chicago Bears free agents and into free agency. Let's switch over to wide receiver because to me, this is a, a chasm of, of problems here. Obviously, beautiful at the top with DJ Moore. I don't think there's any way that Darnell Mooney is going to return. I don't think Darnell Mooney is going to want to return uh, based on how his 2023 season went. Tyler Scott, to me, is not a guy who's ready to be your third wide receiver. You can keep him plugged in as your fourth wide receiver and, and see where he goes this year. That's that's fine for me. Kind of if you can get a mid-round wide receiver for competition with Tyler Scott for that fourth spot for me, I'm okay there. And, of course, Valus Jones doesn't have any reason to be on this roster if the only reason I think he might be is because it's really hard to basically overturn your entire wide receiver position group in one off season, which is almost where the bears are. So Brad, I'm going to start with you to me. They need to focus on a wide receiver two and a wide receiver three, which means I think they need to address it early in the draft and find someone in free agency. 
Yeah, I think it's very simple. You're sitting there at nine. If one of uh, Malik Neighbors or Romo Dunze is there, you run the pick in. Uh, if not, I think they might trade down. Let's ignore, like, do they take a tackle or whatever. I wouldn't take a defensive player at nine, no matter the player. You know, I know Dallas Turner tested very well. He added mm-hmm. some weight at Alabama. I know people love, uh, you know, Murphy out of Texas. I wouldn't do it. So um, you trade down, and you still take the next crop of receiver. You're, you're Brian Thomas Jr., you're whoever. Um, and then also, if I'm sitting there in the, the third round or later, and another name pops up, and we could sit, we could do a full podcast just naming good draft pick uh, receivers. Like I, I would, do, I, I would go again. So, free agency wise, it's not a good group. Obviously, Mike Evans, who no one expected to be a target, but but he got signed today. Um, you know, tags for for T Higgins and Michael Pittman are expected. I think the only name that like you maybe throw out there, I'm personally not a huge fan, but I just think it makes some sense. Uh, is Gabe Davis in Buffalo? Just I think he brings a different skill set. He can block in the run game. And he can have 18 yard average depth of target, kind of you know take the top off the field a little bit, let DJ Moore cook at the intermediate and underneath areas. The rest of the crop, one other name that, that people mention, which I do see, is DJ Moore's old buddy Curtis Samuel from their shared days in Carolina. Uh, he can be a deep threat. He can be a ball carrier. He can attack in the middle of the slot. Um, but yeah, it's it's not a good group. I think the draft is your solution at wide receiver. All right, EJ. I would agree. This is an extremely deep wide receiver class. We are going to see guys that start coming out of the bottom of the third round, even the top of the fourth for certain teams. Um, I, I keep being reminded of Ron Wolf's old axiom when he was in Green Bay. I'm going to take a quarterback every year. I think that's swapped in the league now, and it's I'm going to take a wide receiver every year because it's a tremendously expensive position. And Everybody needs at least two good ones. And that is extremely difficult to maintain because if you, you know, pick a third round wide receiver and they excel, they're going to be making $20 million a year when they're up for a free contract. So you just kind of have to continually keep that coffer full. It's difficult to do. This is a good year to do it. So, uh, yes, the Bears have a gaping need. Luckily, the draft is a cornucopia. It's going to provide this year. There's going to be guys you can pick in the third or the fourth round just because there's so many receivers that are going to be contributors. And just got to give a shout out to my guy, Joe Reed, who is on the roster. He's going to be wide receiver five. But look, he's got return ability. He's got special teams ability. That's what you need out of a wide receiver five. I was a big Joe Reed fan coming out of Virginia. So he might fill one of those holes down the way. But I'm I'm with Brad. You need to. I love Tyler Boyd, but he is slot only. Waldron's not going to love that. He loves a lot of motion in his offense. He's not going to like a player that he can't motion outside. Who is going to command, again, a fairly good salary because it's kind of Gabe Davis and then what? Tyler Boyd's going to be the next guy up to get paid. You're probably going to have to overpay to get a guy like Tyler Boyd. So I really think you go with young, cheap talent, labor at this position. There's a bunch of it in the draft. Go get some. Well, first of all, yeah, first of all, I apologize, my – Cat got locked in the office with me, and she is Woo-hoo! not at all excited to be in here. So she was pounding on the door. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it almost kind of feels like they could add two, maybe three. Obviously, you know, not all of those are going to be big resources, but I mean, you could go out, and that, that's kind of the problem. Like I was looking at the free agent list, and it's like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't see him going out and spending money on a guy like. Uh, Ridley. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so it's like you start really looking at that list and it's like there, there's not a ton out there. One name actually I, I like a decent amount um, and I, I felt like he was pretty solid last year with Houston is Noah Brown. I think Noah Brown can make a lot of sense. It's kind of like that wide receiver three. You have a guy like uh, Tyler Scott, you know, that you can kind of float back behind there. And then, you know, you take two two receivers like EJ was talking about. It's a deep receiver core, man. It's like you take one at nine, and then you turn around and you take one in the you know the fourth or fifth round. A guy like Luke McCaffrey could make some sense. Like there's so many different options, and we saw it last year with Green Bay. Green Bay actually, as much as we could hate on Green Bay, they had a shotgun approach to receiver, and it worked out pretty damn well for them last year. So I think that that's the kind of role that the Bears need to take. I mean, they got DJ Moore, uh, Brad. You probably may know a little bit more about this than me, but it feels like at some point soon the Bears are probably going to want to extend DJ Moore, maybe give him a little bit more money, kind of you know reset reset that a little bit. So I don't know that it's going to make a ton of sense for them to go out and pay another receiver 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year. I think they'll wait one more offseason and do it next year. Um but yeah, it's it's a good point. 
All right, let's move over to the running back position. EJ, I'm going to start with you because I know if there's one guy here that wants to go and find Saquon Barkley and pay him $17 million a year, it's you. You love spending, <laughs> no, money. No, you I love don't. spending money on running backs. No, I you love know. running backs. I don't love spending money on running backs. Uh, strange story from the combine. You end up in in just mixed company all the time and and you never really know who you're going to end up with. Ended up sitting with uh, Austin Eckler's agents at a bar in the bottom of the Marriott. Didn't know it was them. Uh, went up to talk to somebody else that somebody left and it's one of those odd sort of pauses in conversation I'm like so what do you do and they're like oh we're agents and I'm like who's your client and they're like Austin Eckler and I was like oh why the long faces fellows and they're like well we're gonna get some contract offers tomorrow and we're not super happy about it and I was like welcome to the running back market in 2024 it's it, it's not a pleasant uh you know, position for the players or the agents, but it's not a bad position for teams to be in because these guys are not going to get huge offers. And there's some proven players out there. I'd say in the mid range, I don't, I don't think the bears are going to take a huge swing, but the bottom line is the draft is the big hammer sitting behind all this. And Brad will back this up. Like there are probably 10 guys that are going to be undrafted free agents in this class. That could be RB three on most teams in the NFL. And that's what teams are going to rely on. Like, Hey, you don't want to take our, Low ball offer for your running back? Fine. We'll wait. We'll call this guy up. We'll pay him a $10,000 bonus, and he'll be in our camp, and we'll be fine with that. And it's just a rough market for those guys right now. So they might be able to squeeze some value out of the free agency market. It'll be fun to see who lasts into the second tier. I don't I don't think it's a priority for them. They do need some reinforcement there, but it's not a thing to do first. And I think, again, the world's their oyster. If they don't get it in free agency for a very reasonable price, they can wait to late in the draft or after the draft, pick up a couple of guys, have competition, and come out with a very solid player. Aaron? Yeah, I I mean, I don't know, man. I, I know everybody's got their own opinions. I, Why would you – I think last year was a prime example of why you don't go out and spend a ton of money on running back. I mean, look at look at the, the franchise tag guys. Look, look at I – mean, Josh Jacobs was okay, but he was nowhere near as good as he was uh, the year prior. Saquon Barkley, same thing, wasn't the same guy. Tony Pollard looked like a shell of himself. Austin Eckler looked like he was running like a 40-year-old. Like, And this is somebody that a lot of people were talking about wanting to trade for last offseason. It's kind of like that final piece to maybe you know make that push. And, and that's the thing is I think that that's a cautionary tale to where people can point to a guy like David Montgomery. And I'm, I'm super happy for David Montgomery, but the reality of it is most of the time – Signing free agent running backs to decent money, even six million dollars a year, doesn't usually work out. So I would rather just see him add somebody, and and you know, it, you want to do a cheap free agent deal, cool. You want to go out and add somebody in, uh, you know, with the draft pick or an undrafted free agent. I mean, every year we see it, man. These late round guys that come out of nowhere, um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. I feel like they're one and two are pretty solid. I'm hoping Roshan Johnson's a little bit better this year and gets a little bit more opportunity than he did last year, but. Running back's just one of those things, man. I, and I know, you know, obviously we'll talk about quarterback, but even even without Justin Fields, I feel like you can get a decent running game without having to go spend big money on a running back. Brad, any reason to spend on a running back <laughs> or five million a year on a running back this offseason? <laughs> don't, don't laugh because you're kicking it to the nerd about the running back thing. I've actually – I uh, I have pivoted – it doesn't apply to the Bears. I have pivoted a little bit <laughs> by thinking that, like, we're getting to an inflection point mm -hmm. to where I'd probably rather pay – you mentioned the Montgomery deal, James Conner. You know, of course, I could pick all the hits and, and ignore all the misses. But, like, I think there are some values in the middle tier now of running back free agency – because of how suppressed this market has gotten that I'd rather do, uh, you know, than use a top 150 pick or hundred pick uh, on the position if I had other, other needs. So I don't mind them adding a piece. I'm not really looking to operate in the Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs market. I, I, I like the committee or the piece the pieces of a committee they have right now, maybe drop another piece in there, um, a more reliable, you know, third down pass catcher, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, no, no one, no one meaningful or, or, or substantial. Well, Brad, right. Important, important question. Would you rather pay Saquon Barkley $10 to $12 million a year or Cairo Santos $4 million a year? <laughs> I actually want to shout out Strickland back. The, the structure of the Santos deal is great. People don't care about this, but it's year to year. They basically, there's like no pro rate of money. They just basically like, if we like you each offseason, we'll give you $3 million to stick around. So I love the structure. I just, I don't know. Anyway. Brad, this is why you're my favorite. You are just the right kind of off. Like the kicker's deal structure is like golden. It's so good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. I give me guys like 
Dearness Johnson, Craig Reynolds, Ty Johnson in the middle of that market for very low money on the second or third wave. They're very capable players. They're going to be hungry for jobs because this is basically running back musical chairs at this point is there's not going to be enough seats. And those guys I'm talking about that are hanging out at the end of the draft that are extremely cheap. You're going to pay that guy five, ten thousand dollar bonus. You're going to pay him, you know, what's rookie minimum these days, four hundred thousand like with no structure on the deal like they're just sitting there and teams are going hey you can take this or we can go get those guys your your choice excellent point on roshan johnson as well if you increase you know the offensive line depth in front of him and the cohesiveness he's going to look a lot better he's a very good player he didn't get to show a lot of that last year um i think you're going to get sort of addition by addition there from the running back room just by beefing up the o-line all right (laughs) <laughs> certainly last and, and certainly not least the quarterback plan we're, we're going to talk about this here a little bit now when we first started putting together this mock off season there was some more uncertainty at least publicly about what the Chicago Bears were going to do obviously things have really started pointing in one direction especially after the week in Indianapolis so especially how I know this group I, I don't think there is much of a reason to debate Justin Fields and whether he should remain the Chicago Bears quarterback. I'll I'll just give a a, a quick synopsis on it. I think Justin Fields is probably near his ceiling. And the other thing I will say, you know, he may get a little better, a better scheme could help him. There's plenty of things you could do to get more out of Justin Fields. But, and and this was one thing that was not talked about the entire off season until the last couple weeks, the Justin Fields contract was always a, massive situation for the Chicago Bears. There was no way you were going to pass up on all these rookie quarterbacks and be able to pay him a Geno Smith kind of contract. It was going to go north of Daniel Jones. Now you trade him and, you know, he has issues and he becomes a backup or borderline starter. That salary comes way down. But if the Chicago Bears were to commit to him, this was the kind of market they were creating. So this has never really been a consideration for me. This has always been, it hasn't, to me, this hasn't been Justin Fields or Caleb Williams. This has been moving on from Justin Fields and which rookie quarterback do the Chicago Bears want to select. So does anyone have anything they want to add here on Justin Fields before we kind of dive into the quarterback plan and talk a little bit about backups? Oh, man. It's, that's a, it's a bummer. Like, Nobody wants it's, to go in the pool. As excited, as excited as I am, because, I mean, dude, I'm an Oklahoma fan. Like, you know, like, and I, and I know everybody's heard this by now. I'm an Oklahoma fan. Like, I have loved Caleb Williams from the first time that he stepped out of the field. Like, I followed him when he was at Gonzaga High School. Like, he was an exciting player. But – I. It's one of those things. Like I can still remember watching the Bears trade up to eleven and take Justin Fields, and and the feeling of thinking like the Bears finally have the quarterback, and here we are, you know, four years later, and we're talking. It, it almost feels like the same conversation we had when Trubisky left, right? Like obviously Trubisky was after four years, and you know Justin Fields is going in the fourth year, and I think Justin Fields is a better quarterback. But it's just it's 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 very bittersweet because it's like. It's exciting, but at the same time, it's also very disappointing when you really look back. And maybe you guys didn't feel the same way, but I was, let's put it this way I was more excited for the Bears drafting Justin Fields than when they traded for Khalil Mack. Um, so that's, that, that's oh, kind of where I'm at. I agree. I think the Justin Field, the trade up for Justin Fields was the, other than playoff football, was the most exciting thing the Bears had done probably since Jay Cutler. And I think there was more mixed reaction from the fan base about people going, oh, Cutler's not going to be good enough to be it. To me, I have never seen the Chicago Bears fan base unite like they did the night of the draft when they took Justin Fields. I remember EJ, Jeff Burke, Burkus and I did an entire like hour and a half podcast on Justin Fields. There was a level of excitement and it's absolutely disappointing that this is the direction it's going. Yeah, we were thrilled. Memories. Oh yeah, I know it's, this is, this is the hard part. We knew this was coming, uh, you know, but Kelsey's got us prepped today by, you know, giving his retirement speech so we could get all the tears out of the way. Mm-hmm. Um, no, we were very excited about Justin Fields and his potential and, you know, given another landing spot, it might have been different. The bottom line is it isn't different. We are, you know, 39 or 40 games in however many games. It's a lot of games for a starter in the NFL. Um, you know, NFL stands for not for long and, not many guys that aren't very good get that many starts. He's had that many starts. Yes, there have been ups and downs, and you can blame everything else. But one thing 
about right. players that quote unquote have it at that position, you will see flashes of it even when they are not supported. You will go, oh man, you know, if he had a better surrounding cast, if he had a better scheme, look at look at those plays. And people will say there've been fields flashes, but the consistency hasn't been there. Um, and the Bears, as they had this opportunity, and I've said this since pretty early on this year, as this situation unfolded, they're not going to be able to let this go. Like they can't just sit and say, well, we hope Justin gets a lot better when you've got the top overall pick in the draft in a good quarterback year. That's just not something a team has the luxury to be able to do. And I hope Justin succeeds wherever he goes. I would love to see it again. I'm not less excited about Justin, the person or Justin, the athlete, but Justin as the quarterback in Chicago has run its course and it's time to do something different. All right. So let's talk about the rookie, you know, quarterback. Obviously they have the number one pick. There's been plenty of bears fans that want them to trade out of that spot. Maybe trade with Washington, still take a quarterback to me. And I've said this for probably a couple months at this point, whoever your QB one is, don't trade away your Q, your opportunity to get QB one and settle for QB two ever. I don't care what kind of offer anyone is bringing in. You never settle for a quarterback because you'll always be the you know thinking there when your QB one that is on another team and is going to you know back to back Pro Bowls and Super Bowls and and everything else. And your quarterback didn't work out. You said, well, that draft capital certainly wasn't worth it now. So you never trade down if you can't get again. If the Chicago Bears came to the finish their evaluations and said drake may is our top quarterback if that's what they actually believe okay well then you could trade down the two and take drake may but for me you know i've looked at enough of these these top four quarterbacks they all have very unique skill sets a lot of them are special in, in their own ways you know i, I think you're going to have multiple of these four hit you know you never have all four hit but you know you're going to have two or three of these guys hit i really do believe that but to me caleb williams is a different athlete caleb williams you know, all the research I've done, the rumors that were flying around for months about him are false. I do think the Bears probably have some concerns about him in terms of who exactly he's going to be in the locker room. But that's what this next month is about. And I don't think unless a major red flag comes out, you know, and again, we've seen everything now here with Albert Breer and, and Schefter and, and Rappaport. All the big guns are saying the exact same thing. This is Caleb Williams to the Chicago Bears, unless something major happens before the draft in a negative way. So anyone have anything they want to add about the Caleb Williams and the fit in the with the Chicago Bears? I, I, I EJ, feel free to disagree. We obviously had different conversations. We also had many, you know, same conversations over a pint or two. But Caleb Williams is the consensus QB1 of Indianapolis by a Honestly, wider margin than I would have expected. And I also think that from teams that I talked with and met with him, overwhelmingly positive things to say about who he is as a person. I thought he handled his podium or the first, a, I don't know if we can swear, asshole, sorry if we can't swear, That's that had his ridiculous question to start his podium. He handled it with class and just moved on. Yep. The, 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 how we've gotten with this and, and the coverage of Caleb Williams is honestly getting to a point where it's like disgusting. Like it's like there's a new rumor every day. There's a new thing every day. And the kid, the guy was just like happy go lucky. He was he hung out in the field and was like hugging Roma Dunze. We probably you know never played with her. Like it's just anyway. Uh, yeah. I, I think he's the, I think he's the QB one, and, and I think that's what the Bears are going to do. No, you're not wrong. And we've had a little bit more information on this uh, since last year um, in terms of the person of the player because there there were a lot of things we've all seen the maelstrom around. And it's this weird convergence between folks that love fields, folks that might not be sure about Caleb Williams, folks who are just Bears fans like us with PTSD who see one thing and go, oh, God, I've seen that before in a quarterback that failed. I don't want that again. So many of the things about Caleb's game that have been listed as a negative or Caleb the person, which is really where it gets sort of crossing a line for me, that have been listed as a negative are just absolutely false. And I've had to sit here and listen to all those and push back and say, that's that's not what I hear. I don't believe that's true. Um, you know, let the process play out. And and now we're seeing that. It feels like the combine was kind of a watershed moment, the on the field, the podium. Uh, teams, certainly, which is much more important, meeting with him and going, dude, 
this guy's really solid. I talked to a bunch of team guys that were like, we had some concerns going in just because of all the noise, all the smoke. We wanted to check for ourselves. We came out with a green sheet. He is 100% great, which is what we've been hearing out of USC since he arrived. You talked about this in terms of him transferring from Oklahoma. And folks at USC say since the day he arrived, he's been that guy. He's been 100% consistent. He is a team leader. They would run through walls for him. They love this kid. They would take bullets for him. And that is not typical. A lot of people say, yeah, he's our leader and yeah, he's a good player. No, this is not that. And they've been saying that since he arrived from Oklahoma. They've been saying that since last year. And to have all this stuff bubble up about, oh, insert vague character reference shot here that I'm not comfortable with. Like, I really feel like after the combine, we're starting to see all that stuff melt away because we're starting to have that sort of unification of teams, fans, public perception going, hey, this seems like a really good dude who is incredibly talented. And I think those two points are converging. I think it's true. And I think the Bears will draft him and they're in for a player who is very good. Does he have flaws and things to work on? He absolutely does. He's a young quarterback, but he has he has heights in his game that no one else in this draft class or previous couple of draft classes have. Well, I don't know, man. I, I've... Like I said, I, being a big Oklahoma fan, I, I know a few people who cover the team that are around the team a lot. There was not a bad thing said about him when he was at Oklahoma. There wasn't a bad thing said about him when he left Oklahoma. I think everybody understood why he left. I mean, I, and, I, and I think he's quirky to a certain extent. I mean, he knows he's really good. His dad knows he's really good. This has been the plan for quite a while. Um, you know, he's, he's a unique person. But I, a lot of the character stuff – what I've heard from his time in Oklahoma, even kind of leaking in the time in the USC, it's it's just not there, man. And it, it's it's frustrating, but at the same time, I, I think we kind of have to rewind back a little bit and, and realize every year there's a quarterback being attacked, right? Last year, right. CJ Stroud was that guy. Justin Fields is that guy at one point. Every year there's a guy getting attacked. Um, I, I feel like more than anything, it's there's a lot of prospect fatigue with Caleb Williams. Or everybody loved him so much last year, and then this year things didn't go quite as well, and everybody was like, well, 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 maybe this isn't the guy. Maybe he's not mentally right. I'm telling you right now, and again, there's some bias in this. I'm an Oklahoma fan. I get that. Go back and watch that. Just go back and watch the entire Oklahoma and Texas game back in 2021. Oklahoma was getting the crap kicked out of them. Spencer Rattler couldn't stop turning the ball over. Uh, Caleb Williams had barely thrown any passes up to that point as a true freshman, came into that game, led them back. They've won the game. He made some incredible throws, some incredible plays. I don't care if that was three years ago or not. You cannot tell me that somebody isn't special simply based on what he was able to do as a freshman, elevating as a freshman. You want to talk about how much USC struggled this year? That's completely fine with me. But let's also recognize that their defense was absolutely horrific. So it, I don't know, man. Again, it, it, it's one of those – I. I get defensive with with certain things, and it's kind of even like the over the top field stuff when people take shots at Fields as a person, uh, you know, calling. And, and I love Cap, but calling him cowardly for for unfollowing on social media stuff like that. It's like we can we can have our own football valuations of these guys, um, but when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, they're still human beings, and I mean, they're still they're still young men. I mean, we're talking 20, 22 year old and Caleb Williams, twenty five year old and Justin Fields, and I think sometimes we forget that. And he, that's as a former NFL scout, QB one Spencer Rattler in this draft. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, oh, get that joke, you know exactly what that's about. But yeah, uh, yeah. Let, let's briefly talk about backup quarterback. Brad, I'll start with you. Are you a keep a guy like Nathan Peterman around, who Caleb Williams has been working out with, and and <laughs> QB two, or do you want to bring in a legit backup? Sometimes I gotta remember it's not a, this isn't a radio hit. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, you look into an upgrade there. It, it's interesting. I actually think it's something um, that someone asked me. Um, I don't know if it was the combiner before, and I was like, honestly, it's a phenomenal question. Where they were like, look, we saw some nice stuff from Pageant. Peterman is Peterman, but like it, hypothetically, it's a rookie quarterback coming in. Do you want? a backup that maybe knows Shane Waldron or just is more experienced or maybe it wasn't a high draft pick that can relate in some way, like, like any sort of, uh, you know, whatever. And I kind of do. I kind of sit here and be like, if Drew Locke is available for a decent price because he knows <laughs> Shane Waldron. naming Drew Locke with those attributes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he's drafted top 50 and he's got good vibes and, and he, keeps the, he keeps the room loose, um, you know, and, and so – 
I actually think I would rather look for a decent upgrade. I'll, I'll say this. Like, I know everyone's going to talk about how it's the year of the backup quarterback in 2023, and so many guys played and mattered. All that is true. There's just so many guys that I think eventually you'll be able to get a quality backup for cheap. Like, I would, I would give Tyrod Taylor a call. I think he was the QB1 in New York this past year. That applies to both teams. Like, he was the QB1 at New Jersey. He was the QB1 in the state of New Jersey. Um, like, I, I'm looking for a quality veteran that, that I trust to – Bring along, you know, a, a rookie Caleb Williams in this hypothetical. EJ? Yeah, it's a necessary position. I don't think the Bears have their QB2 on the roster right now. There's a lot of ways to go. It's difficult. We've seen teams bring in two rookies. You know, RG3 and Kirk were drafted the same year, uh, you know, up and down the board by Washington. That's a That strategy has its own risks. It also obviously has its own rewards. Um, but there's a lot of guys out there. I do Again, I'm not comfortable with the guys the Bears have in the room, quote unquote, right now. A guy like Tyler Huntley makes a lot of sense to me. He's had proven success. He knows what it is to be the backup. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to be looking for a number one deal. I think he realizes that that might not be on the table at this point. Um, you know, very athletic. So you're not going to have to change the offense if you're Shane Walter. And if presumably Caleb Williams goes down, you can keep most of your playbook with Tyler Huntley. Um, and and just keep rolling Tyrod Taylor the same way. Very, very experienced, been in a bunch of different systems, seems to be a very mature guy, um, understands what his role is in the league now. So I would be for that as well. I think both of those guys are much better than either of the guys currently sitting in the Bears backup room. I, and I think it's kind of fair because I think when you're looking at this, assuming they go with a rookie quarterback, right, it doesn't matter which one it is. I mean, I don't know that you're going to want Tyson Bajan as your quarterback too at this point. I mean, that's just not a very conventional route to go. Um, I mean, you guys have pretty much hit on all the all the different veterans out there. I, I really wish that they could go out and get a guy like Jacoby Brissett, but I don't. I just don't think financially that makes a ton of sense. So I think Tyrod Taylor – Huntley, um, Drew Locke, if they want somebody with some, uh, you know, with some familiarity with the system. I mean, there's there's quite a few options out there, but ultimately, it, again, I mean, correct me if, if you guys feel differently, but I don't think anything more like two or three million dollars a year makes much sense. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's got to be in the affordable range, but there's there's absolutely upgrades to be had. So let's uh, let's take a quick break on the podcast side. We we come back. It is time to trade. Justin Fields. This is Bears <laughs> Banter. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back into the podcast. Brad, I'm going to throw it over to you here as we continue through here, because now we're going to start. We've kind of finished the evaluations here. We're going to start building this off season. And I think before we can do any of it, now the Chicago Bears might be doing some of it before they do this based on the market, but Let's talk about Justin Fields. Let's talk about potential places to go because Justin Fields is not the primary uh, target for a lot of these teams. He is the backup plan. Atlanta wants to try Kirk Cousins, try Baker Mayfield. Then maybe they'll go to Justin Fields. You know, we're hearing we're hearing a lot of things like that, that teams have priorities they want to try and land before going to Fields. So who are some teams that you think – don't have access probably to the top four quarterbacks. You know, if Mayfield stays in Tampa, Cousins, Russell Wilson now is out there. You know, there, there's a lot of veterans. Let, let's try and shape Fields' market here before we can find a landing spot for him. Yeah, so I still do think Pittsburgh is interested to a degree. Uh, I think it makes sense. And then, you know, you and I spoke about this, and, and, you know, credit to you. You actually threw out the tweet kind of talking about how you didn't expect the market to be all that strong. And every national insider in the game basically, you know, said that from Indy, uh, you know. So the only other team that I think, and this is based on no inside information, I've just decided in my head it's a good idea, um, <laughs> is the Seattle Seahawks are intriguing to me. I think the way that the messaging around Geno Smith has been bizarre, why they had to come out and say, yeah, he's still going to be on the team. Yeah, you're paying him $25 million. Why wouldn't Geno Smith still be on the team? Yeah, we, he's our guy. Yeah. It's just the way they have approached it is strange to me. We know they're now the QB rehabilitation organization. They've done a phenomenal job with it. Um, but, yeah, <clears throat> I've never got the sense Atlanta was seriously in the market. Maybe they are, and I'm wrong, and everyone else is on that one. I I've heard Kirk Cousins the whole way there. Um, and I'm trying to think who else. Like, I don't think Sean Payton would be a great fit for Justin Fields uh, in Denver. Las Vegas, I don't think the guy that just got fired as OC is going to make a trade for the quarterback that he might think got him fired. Um, I think it's a short list. Of, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's my opinion, but um, I think it's a pretty short list of teams. 
So yeah. I just want to interrupt this real quick. The Bears have traded uh, for Ryan Bates, uh, giving up a fifth round pick in this year's draft. Oh. Yeah, that's coming straight from the Bills account. That makes if folks no remember, point. that's the guy who yeah, huh? tried that they tried to RFA. sign last year. Yes. <laughs> interesting. Uh, huh. Okay. That's very interesting. Odd yeah. to me. A, a I, fifth, I don't mind the player at all. Like, a, let's a, talk but about a fifth that. round pick when the they already don't have a lot of is draft capital tough to me. This is this is a 2024 fifth round pick. Yeah, 2024 yeah. fifth round pick. The Bears just announced it too. Why do I feel like Ryan Pace is the general manager? That it seems very odd. It feels maybe like Pace's pranking polls at this point and just had the text all queued up from last year. It was like, I'll send this again and see what happens. Um, no, I'm I like the idea. We were just talking about the need for backup on the interior O line, but do you feel so unsure coming out of Indy? Because the timing would say you do. You just looked at all these guys and you went, there's nobody there. Or again, we want to remove a need, but you basically build another one by taking a draft pick to do it. It's very strange timing because honestly, if we're talking about players in that range, you know, there are some boy, the timing is what gets me in terms of like the timing and the price combined. Those two things. It's a very weird convergence. Great player. I don't have any problem with the player at all. He's very solid. I think he could compete for a starting spot. But yeah, timing and prices. I just don't know what to make of either of those things combined. Yeah, I'm sorry to derail. I just no, it, it's it's relevant information. Yeah, no, this is this is not a derailment at all, but this this makes me also wonder. Because this is a you know a potential starting caliber piece. Is this just a guy in case Nate Davis doesn't hit, in case Tevin Jenkins is having injury problems? Uh, well, we could have that discussion. I think there's a I think both of those guys are on shakier ground than a lot of Bears fans think they are. When I talk to Bears fans by and large that I meet, they're all like, We're set at guard. We got Davis and Jenkins. And I'm like, Well, neither one of those teams got seems really set after last year. Jenkins with injuries and Nate Davis, you know multiple different things went on with him but his performance just again going from the tape was not great there was a lot of times he got beat like a drum so neither of those guys felt like super solid in their roster so people were just kind of poo-pooing the idea of like grabbing another guard um obviously the bears felt similarly because that's a lot quite frankly to throw at a backup guard uh it's a decent shot for a guy that could rotate in and be you know, what we were asking for, which is a real third piece on the inside of the offensive line for the Bears. Does, so does, is, anyone, does anyone have his what he signed with with Buffalo? Brad, do you yeah, have I just, tweet, I just tweeted out, the Bears are inheriting a two-year, $8 million deal uh, for Ryan Bates. Look, I think this is a, he, he's played at center. Maybe they think he's a starting center. Um, I, I also I think he's probably more likely a swing guard or a swing interior at all three spots. But, yeah, I think this mo mostly speaks to uh, – the lack of faith in the health of, of Tevin Jenkins and Nate Davis. I don't know if he beats those guys out for a starting job, um, but yeah, fifth round pick in the draft where they don't have a sixth or a seventh already. Do they now only have one through four? Um, and they don't yeah, have, they a have no fifth, sixth, seventh. Now, again, this might be the draft to not have any fifth, sixth, seventh round picks. That's what we've heard. That's about. what we've heard. It's a suit. Like the teams are going to be like begging to get out of the sixth and seventh. Those on the round, podcast, you know? EJ vehemently. Now I'm like, no, no, <laughs> give me all those picks every time I run a mock draft because there's a lot of players I like down the board. And I like the shotgun approach. We talked about Green Bay taking that approach with wide receiver. We've seen other teams do that trade down. We've seen the Rams do it famously trade down, have a lot of low round picks get a bunch of hits out of there. Again, you know your hit rate is not going to be anywhere near 100%. So why not have seven picks in the last three rounds instead of two, or in this case, zero? All right. We don't we don't, we don't, don't think that this is going to be like their I, – I, I know I'm probably being paranoid just because we've seen the Bears do stuff like this in the past. I refuse we don't think, think that this is the center. starting center. Right? No, I refuse, I refuse to believe. I, I would hope not. I would no. not be satisfied with that as a center. I would still leave. <laughs> All right, let, let's switch back to Justin Fields here. Let's try and find him a home. Aaron, what, what do you think here? I know Brad was kind of pa painting a picture here. I know he brought up the Seahawks. I will bring up one team. You know, Rich Eisen talked about it earlier today that he thinks the Giants are completely done with Daniel Jones. To me, I understand the Giants are sitting at six and, you know, there's going to be a you know potential quarterback, you know, at least within range 
uh, for, for them to, to take there. But I, I also know, you know, being in New York, I know how the Giants think. And I don't know if the Giants right now are going to be sitting here going, it's time to totally reboot this thing, being they are a year removed from the playoffs. I could be wrong about that. But I could see the Giants emerge if Kirk Cousins ends up in Atlanta, if, you know, the, you know, Minnesota and the Raiders are the type of teams that are still looking for a quarterback where you got Luke Getzey in an interdivision trade, and that may not be something the Bears want to do. I like Brad's idea with the Seahawks. I also think the Giants could be a dark horse team here that could get involved with fields in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I've honestly, man, I've really struggled to find that like that one team that just makes a ton of sense. I mean, Pittsburgh feels like they should be it because, frankly, if they're if they really think Kenny Pickett's that guy, I I don't know. You know, that doesn't make a ton of sense. The only thing there, obviously, is with Arthur Smith being there. I mean, they could just go outside Ryan Tannehill for relatively cheap. And, and and that's kind of where I'm struggling and looking at this. It's like, I just, it's tough to find. It's tough to pinpoint that spot. I mean, two days ago I had Atlanta, but it seems like Kirk Cousins is trending towards Atlanta. And, you know, I, I don't know, man, I, I'm struggling. I'll be honest. I'm struggling to find it because it feels like there's that one team that will come out of absolute nowhere. It could be the Giants. Um, I don't think it's going to be the Raiders. Um I don't know. The one team that kind of like that keeps popping into my head, and I know it's probably not very logical, is New England. Just because if they, if they do that, it's like they can trade away what you know they got an early early third round pick they can give up. They can give up a third round pick the year after that, and then they can turn around and do whatever they want at three. They can do whatever they want in the, in the second round as well. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm struggling. I'm just kind of I'm, I'm punching that air right now. To be completely honest with you. All right, EJ. Where uh, I said where, the where? a couple of weeks ago. Um, because they just, I, I had one of those early morning or late night thoughts. I don't remember which one it was. And I thought, damn, Dable did a lot with Daniel Jones in his first year. They made the playoffs. They shouldn't have that year. They won nine games. It was largely on the strength of Daniel Jones running. It was not on the strength of him throwing. He's had a lot of Dable's had a lot of success with Josh Allen. I'm not saying it fields is Josh Allen, but you've got a big guy that can absolutely run take some punishment, throw some shots down the field. He understands how to build an offense around that. And I, long before Eisen said anything about it today, you can't be a Giants anything and not be like, this is not the answer with Daniel Jones. Like nothing against the guy, the person, but in terms of a player leading that franchise forward, like no kidding, they're done with him. He's not going to lead them to the promised land. That is over. So that was one I definitely was stronger on the Raiders before. It really seems like Atlanta is set on kind of a more set piece in the pocket quarterback who can sort of maximize all their weapons. Um, New England, I have gone back and forth on. I'm with you, Aaron. I like it. It's sort of, it's one way to go. New England needs a lot of help on the offensive side of the ball. If they thought that could get them that, I understand that it would bring them a new dynamic. Um, You can think of the cam year. And, you know, just sort of pump that up a little bit with a healthy Justin Fields. The only other one, and this is a backup plan. This is one that my other podcast partner, Brett Coleman, has been bringing up. Mostly just because he wants to see Justin land there. And it's not a starting job, so it wouldn't be a high round pick. Is the Rams as a succession plan to Stafford. With having had, you know, success with mobile quarterbacks there. And McVay understanding, like, how to do that. It would be a departure for them, but he he is drawing that line. So I think like probably like Giants, it, it has to be two teams, right? There can't just be one team because if there's one team, they're not bidding against themselves and you're not getting anything for them. So if the Bears are going to get anything for Fields, it has to be two teams that are at least lukewarm on interest. For me, I would probably settle on Giants and the Steelers right now. Yeah, and like I said, look, and anything's possible. I just don't know if the Steelers are ready to completely pivot off Pickett. And to me, if you're trading draft capital for Fields, you're you're, you're pivoting off Pickett. At least that's the way I see it. I think like a Ryan Tannehill type, especially with the ties to Arthur Smith, is probably the direction they go. That's why I think a, a, a weird team, a team we're not hearing about right now, like the Giants or Seahawks. And while I, I doubt the ability to land a 2024-2, I am seeing here that the New York Giants have two second round picks at 39 and 47. So Brad, I'll, I'll switch back to you. Do you think there's any way, and I don't add a sweetener with Justin Fields. Is there any way the, that the bears could land 47 from the giants in a trade? That's the uh, Seattle Seahawks pick for the Leonard Williams trade. Um, 
I don't really see it unless the Bears are kicking back like their fourth. Uh, what about a what about a fifth round pick? Two thousand twenty-four. I was gonna pick? say what fifth round pick? They <laughs> no, just said, gave it away. No, no, oh, I know, I know, I know. no, I said fourth. Uh, I said fourth. Like it would be a swap where it's like you know you're you're getting forty. Uh, no, is my. I, <laughs> would, you, would, would, would you be any interested in seeing if the Giants would be interested in dropping back to nine and then adding a fourth round pick, something like that? I think that I know we're in love with the eight nine swap with the Atlanta talk too. I think teams would rather not have a forty seven, but like six to nine in this draft is a massive, massive move. Um, and yep. in, in most drafts, I mean, I'll look at the Jimmy Johnson chart really quick while we're sitting here. Like, I would bet the value of that is equivalent to a, a very, very high pick. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Let's pull this puppy up. So six to nine is a difference of two hundred and fifty points, which is equivalent to the 68th pick in the draft. So yeah. you know. high, that's a high third round pick. I mean, that's yeah. right about what Justin Fields should go for, right? I suppose. Um, <laughs> you know, but then there's obviously the there's Brad, always you're the too act, you're too like, nice. You can just tell oh, me. Oh, Brad up. is like so lukewarm on this entire idea. He's like, no, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. It's never gonna happen. Um, yeah. it's there's also the tax when you trade up that early, right? So I, I shouldn't look at a flat 250 difference. It should be like you know, add 20 percent. Right. So anyway, I just at this point, the Giants are interesting. I don't hate the idea. Um, I think them and my Seattle idea and Pittsburgh really is more like a if the market gets to a point where dot, dot, dot. And then all those teams are, are in the mix. All right. Let's uh, let's take a quick vote. Where do you want to trade Justin Fields? I'm voting New York. Aaron. You know what? I'll go with New York and I'll say the that 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 nine to six just to just to stick it to Brad. Hey, EJ, how about you? Uh, I'm fine with New York. Uh, it was, you know, an idea I broached a couple of weeks ago. Brad, what do you think is reasonable, right? If if we get that competition, let's just say the chairs start to fill up in musical chairs, right? We know he's not going to go to Minnesota. Let's just say that, you know, Cousins goes to Atlanta. That's, a, I think it's negative 150 in Vegas right now. If that happens, sounds like that's sort of trending that way. Um you know, let's say there's two teams involved. Let's say, you know, Pittsburgh or Seattle and the Giants. So there's a lukewarm bidding war. Neither one of them is really punching up. What do you think is a reasonable like, hey, we want them a little bit more than the other guy? I think a third and a fifth or maybe a, a third and a future fifth that could become a fourth. Like, I think you're getting a day two pick and then it's kind of maybe the, the way the battle finishes is like how early of a day three ta is tacked on by, you know, these hypothetical teams. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to pop in and see what the PFF draft simulator says that we can get off of either one of these teams for Justin Fields. Let's take first, take a look at It'll be more. Now I am the PFF mock draft simulator. I, trade. I, I, <laughs> I realize, I realize, uh, you can talk so, to the man behind the curtain right here in front of you. That's right. Poke the man behind the curtain. So I'm looking yeah. at the giants. They have 70 and then the picks we'd be talking about later would be like 140 or 185. Um, what do you think of a combination of 40 you're talking about 47 or are you talking about 70 70 and 140 so we can replace the the Bates trade that just happened which was 143 and then okay. you get 70 bing bang boom lock it in okay 140 and 70 from the giants let's take a quick look at this the Steelers just for the fun of it and see what would be close the closest there would be uh 84 and you'd either be dropping you'd either be going up to 121 which is a pretty big jump or down to 198 for the second pick that's where i think it's like future conditional pick you know where you try to oh shoot. that might go five to four that kind of thing i like that yeah yeah all right let's just take the giants for simplicity because at least we think we have a decent lock on what compensation would be so it would be 70 and 140 is what you're saying Let's do it. All right, All right. 70 and 140 from the New York Giants to the Chicago Bears for Justin Fields. Offer the trade. If it declines, I'm going to throw a can at you. No, just uh, no. It, just no, no. it's it good. That's it's good. good. I don't need to force it. Uh, <laughs> we are all set. The Bears now own 70 and 140. Justin Fields is the presumptive starting quarterback of the New York football Giants. <laughs> Love it. All right. Now let's let's uh, quickly discuss some of these Chicago Bears free agents. We've already known yeah. Jalen Johnson. You got to do that first. You know, we're going to we're going to put him on the tag. Uh, we, you know, hopefully get an extension. 
But, you know, we're not going to have an extension here in March while the Bears are signing guys. So I think, you know, adding him to the ta- at the tag level is what the Chicago Bears need to do right now. So, so let's go through some of these guys. Uh, let's start uh, at – let's do tight end. We were talking about Mercedes Lewis. Seems like you guys mostly are leaning going away from Lewis and finding a blocker somewhere who can also catch the football. EJ, I believe that was you, so I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind Charlie Warner on like a third wave deal, but in terms of tight end two, I really think Fant or Parkinson – make a lot of sense. Obviously the connection with Waldron, uh, they both fill a role in the bears offense. That's not currently filled by anybody else. Um, so I'll leave it to Brad for those numbers, but just from a theoretical standpoint, do you guys want to start at the high dollar guys or the low dollar guys? Cause well, I, well, well, what I, I want to, I want to just quickly go through the bears the, free agents. Like, oh, bears. free are agents. Gonna, are oh, we, are retaining oh, Lewis, keep? ESB, yeah. Mooney. Yeah. Like, uh, guys. okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. There's, there's not too I'm many tracking. to talk about. So yeah. I'm tracking. You know what? Let's let's do it this way. Can of I just the, give you a list? Yeah, of of Aaron. Why don't you do that? What of the existing Bears free agents? Let's look at who we may want to retain. All right. Well, the most important, obviously, Patrick Scales. Got to get that one out there. <laughs> uh, I think Marcetti's Lewis could make some sense. Uh, Equinemius St. Brown's another one where it's like at that minimum competing for roster spot, almost kind of like Dante Pettis did last year. I don't think that's a terrible move. Uh, Dylan Cole is another one. And then Josh Blackwell, uh, he's an exclusive rights for agent. So, I mean, he's back either way. But those are the only, what would that be, five? Yeah, th- those those are the only five that I had on my list of on my mock off season that I was waiting back. Not spending it at three tech if the Bears end up spending it edge. Does anyone have any interest in returning uh, Justin Jones? Not, not at the if, price he's going to get. Yeah, I was going to say only if he ends up sort of floundering in the market and is willing to come back for less than we think he might get right now. All right. So Equinamius St. Brown, Brad, EJ. I know Aaron said maybe bringing him back. Any interest? Zero. (laughs) It's a really rich receiver class. You're going to be able to get cheaper talent than, than ESB. So, yeah. All right. So uh, Mercedes Lewis, uh, Brad, any interest in keeping him, or do we want to let Mercedes walk as well? I'm down. I'm down to keep Mercedes. Uh, like you know, we've talked about. There are some other inline guys, but far be it from me to not want to retain Mercedes Lewis. Come on now. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm down for Lewis as well. So we want to keep Mercedes Lewis as the third tight end, knowing we still have a, a hole here at at, at the U, U spot, kept pass catching tight end. But we'll keep Mercedes Lewis. But we are going to let Justin Jones. We are going to let. Mooney, ESB, Dot, uh, Foreman. Uh, I know we didn't really talk about Foreman, but I think that's that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, so Lewis is going to be the only guy we retain of the Chicago Bears free agents. Yes? Okay, I'm just going to put my hand up, and I, I'm going to say this is reality versus what EJ wants. I would love to keep Mooney on the team. I think he definitely had a very sour experience, and he has no reason to stay. Now, there's wholesale change. There's a new offensive coordinator, and he's going to get to catch passes from Caleb Williams. He probably knows both. He already knows one of those things. He probably knows both of those things. That might be enough to turn it. If it if it does, I think he's one of the better free agent wide receivers out there. So if you're trying not to make a hole, if he would agree, I would keep him. I fully realize in reality, that's not very likely. All right. So how about we do this? Let's take a quick break because we were a little behind on breaks early and we will come back. We will start putting together a free agent plan and start building this team. We're taking a little bit longer than I hope. So we're going to jump back on free agency right after this break. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back into the podcast. Free agency is where we are going to start. So Brad, I'm going to throw it over to you. A couple tweaks here. Uh, we've retained Mercedes Lewis on what I would assume would be a vet minimum. I don't think that's going to make too much of an impact. But Ryan Bates, now part of the Chicago Bears offensive line. Where are the Bears with cap space, effective cap space? You know, And, of course, the Jalen Johnson franchise tag. Where are the Bears right now and what they can spend? Yeah, the, the bigger constraint is just going to be the cash budget for the team, um, you know, than the cap space. They have plenty of cap. They are obviously, as we saw last offseason, you're probably going to see a fairly flat cash-to-cap structure. And the easiest way for our purposes or our fans want to do it, look what the average annual value is, the APY. Take like 75% of that and have that be your first-year cap hit. It's probably the easiest, simplest, most boilerplate way to do it. But 
once they place the tag on Jalen Johnson, they'll still have a $55 million in cap space, still like eighth in the NFL, you know, after a, a massive tag number that's after the Ryan Bates trade, which we've already updated on over the cap. I didn't do that, but thank you to whoever did that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the cap is not an issue for the Chicago bears. The only financial constraint is how much money the ownership wants to spend. All right. So uh, why don't we go over to you next, Aaron, what would be your top, you know, I, I think we got to look at this at prioritizing spending and where we want to, the bears to spend the most early and then kind of cascade it down from there. What is your top priority? Is it center? Is it defensive line? What, what, what should the bears focus on first? Uh, well, if we're talking most money, I'm going to say defensive end, either Bryce Huff or uh, Jonathan Gennard. The only thing that pulled – so I was originally going to do Jonathan Gennard, but the only thing that pulls me away from him was kind of going back and reading uh, Brad Biggs' 10 thoughts earlier, and he said that one of the things that they're going to be prioritizing, according to the coaches, is speed. And I feel like Gennard a, is a very good edge rusher, and he's very well-rounded, but speed doesn't really come to mind with him. To me, that's more of a Bryce Huff type of thing. So – I feel like if you're going to go out and you're going to spend money on an edge rusher, you might as well, you know, Brad, you had him at, what was it, 16 million a year, I want to say? Grenard is at now at four years, 72, $18 million a year. What about Huff? Huff was oh. 16 and a half? 16. Yeah, th uh, three years, 50 for Huff. Okay. So and is, does Hunter figure into this conversation at all? I mean, the thing, the thing with, at least to me, the thing with Hunter is you're getting, you're probably getting over that $20 million a year mark. And I don't know, are the Bears going to want to spend that much on one player? I don't know. I, that's just my thought. I'm, I'm trying to keep this as conservative as possible, but like what I think they will do versus what I would do. Because if, if it's what I would do, we would be playing Madden right now and I'd be having a blast. But that's <laughs> obviously not going to be the case. So here we are. All right. Um, Brad, where is your focus on where you think the Bears should spend priorities? I know they just traded for a center uh, or, you know, a guy that can play center. Excuse me. Oh, I don't do say that like that. No, I do think he's your swing guard. I, I don't think he's your center. Uh, although, look, we started the show like talking about how Lucas Patrick was a liability and they just added a very good pass blocking interior guy. Uh, so let's not let's not. I know 143 is pretty early. But anyway, um, I'll still go with center. I, I still think that. You want to add, there's just too many good options in free agency. I rattled off 10 names earlier. Um, you know, I think Lloyd Cushenberry is the number one player in the class. Probably gets the strongest deal of all those guys. But I wouldn't mind even like a Coleman Shelton fr from the Rams. Can play center, can play guard as well. Um, played for Shane Waldron. I don't know. Let's, let's go with Coleman Shelton, who I have at three years, 16 mil. Um, you know, I think is a capable starter, a good fit in the run scheme. Um, and has gotten better uh, as a pass protector of, over his career. What's the difference between Coleman Shelton and Cush, money-wise? A good, a good chunk. I think Cush is going to top ten million per year. It's a question of how much. I did lower his projection down from my initial. It's now four years fifty. Um, I kind of made him my like Jawan Taylor, like shot in the dark guy. I think he's just going to do very, very well because I liked his tape a whole lot from this past year. But my opinions are relevant. It's what I get here at Indy. So I heard okay. I was a bit. A bit bullish. I need to be a little bit more bearish with Lloyd uh, Cush and Barry. Well, see, uh, I think you should be bearish and make Cush a bear, but that's just me. Let's do it. Let's do it. Four years, right. 50, Lloyd Cush and Barry, lock it in. Uh, I don't have to leave now. This is great. Yeah. Lloyd Cush and Barry has, is the first off-season signing for the Chicago Bears, and we are saying it's four years and 50 million, correct, Brad? Let's do that. Why not? All right. Now let's uh, let's focus over on the defensive line as I'm trying to do two things at once here. But yep. um, let's talk defensive line because we know edge is going to adding an edge is going to be a priority and we're going to add the acquisitions here on the bottom. Ooh, look at that. All oh, right. Yeah. So uh, defensive end, defensive end. How about defensive edge? There we go. Uh, defensive right. end, Aaron. Uh, Bryce Huff, do we think this is a guy that Eberflus and Poles would want with maybe potential Lyot? Now, again, you can kind of combine him with Demarcus Walker and have Walker in there on, on the early downs. Huff comes in, Walker can bump inside. We know there's the flexibility there. Is Huff a guy we think that Eberflus and Poles would spend on? Because this isn't 13 million a year. This is, you know, probably 17, 18 million a year. 
I I think so. But again, I mean, I think Grenard, at least what I had in my mind originally, Grenard made sense as the better fit. I just, I'm kind of changing. And again, this is just, I've noticed anytime Brad Biggs starts throwing out random names and kind of, you know, doing, dropping these little tea leaves, this right before, like right after the combine, right before free agency, those are usually names yeah. that they're interested in. And again, he didn't drop his name by it wasn't it wasn't Bryce Huff by name, but it was more of they're looking at speed rushers. Um, so again, and, and everybody's perception is different. Maybe some people look at uh, you know Bernard and say, yeah, he's he's got enough speed to be you know a speed rusher. I don't see it that way, so that's why I would go Huff in this situation if I was going off of Biggs is probably very educated speculation. EJ, uh, I'm gonna quote Point Break. Utah, get me two. I want two edge rushers. I'll take Bryce Huff. What's Dorrance Armstrong at, Brad? I'm going to have you dig. He's a he's a guy. Let me pull it up here. He's a guy I like a lot as well. I do think Dan Quinn is going to try to recruit him over to oh, the Washington good point. Commanders. Really um, good point. No, no, no. Hey, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean if we want to tie to Washington. What about uh, Epinesa? So I have Dorrance Armstrong at three years, twenty five and a half, so eight and a half per year. And then I got Epinesa, and, and I do think the Bears are going to talk to. A lot of the Eric Washington guys, because the Bills, as we just sure. saw, um, are trying that that move for them is shedding salary because they're in a tough spot. Um, yeah. You know, they also did draft well um, in, in the the kid in the second round last year. I'm blanking now. EJ can help me out, but um, the guard who, who started for them all year. But um, Epineza, three years, twenty and a quarter mil, six point seven five a year. Th th that's where I have those two deals. I think one of those players would be a nice addition for sure. Okay, I want Huff for the speed. I, I, I'm with you, Aaron. That Biggs is the sort of leanings are, I would say, correct. Um, and I think he's a very good player. Uh, we talked about this a lot, Brian. I talked about this before that tweet went out last year. Like, hey, if we had to pick a guy that was under the radar that might go off this year, Huff was very high up on that list. He did indeed. He's going to get paid. He would be a very nice compliment to Sweat on the other side. So I would, I would say, throw the money at Huff, and if you can find enough money for some rotation again, bringing a guy like Dorrance Armstrong, but it sounds like that's going to be a little bit richer than I maybe thought. Um, Huff, I would be Huff would be my priority there, but I already got Cushionberry, so I don't have a lot of say here. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think you can sign Cushionberry and you can sign Huff, but I would say in terms of heftier salaries, I think you're probably concluding at, at that point. Would be would be what I, I would, would agree. Like. You know, I, I'm not saying they wouldn't sign a wide receiver too and certain things like that, but I do think. That most likely, if they um, if they sign Cushionberry and they sign Huff, that that that's going to be about it from a, a large spending perspective. Would you agree, Brad? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I agree. Man, so I may be aiming a little too high here because I thought they still had some like borderline starters, like a safety or like a wide receiver three or stuff like that. Are we? Are we? No, I I no no I I, I think we can. What I'm saying is, at that point, you're not going out and signing, you know, the Mike Evans. Or something. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I no, you know, the Curtis Samuels and, and Noah Fance and guys like that. I, I think okay. those guys are absolutely still on the board. I'm saying in terms of a big spend, a... Yeah, he's know, talking like, about big ticket north, north of okay. $50 million on a total contract, that kind of thing. I think if they do Cushionberry and they do Huff, that that's probably about, you know, the end in terms of large spending. So... So with that in mind, guys, do you want to spend the money on Bryce Huff? I will say this real quick. I think let's just look at last year, and I think it's a, it's fair to comp it. Tremaine Edmonds is your Bryce Huff, and Lloyd Cushenberry is your Nate Davis. You still have your Demarcus Walker, your TJ Edwards. Like I, I think it's kind of view it in a similar light. We can still add right. a bunch of mid tier guys, but I agree we're not we're, we're no longer talking about making some big splash elsewhere. That's fine. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. All right, so I'm good with both. Brad, where are you comfortable with Bryce Huff's market now? What what would he be bringing in for Chicago? I had three years fifty on him uh, as my current projection. I think I'm on the high side there. You never know in free agency. I I, I could be wrong, but I also I think it's a fair projection. I think he'll get somewhere fifteen to seventeen per, um, somewhere in that window. So again, just we keep just doing. If we're looking at the cap, which we need to look at the cap. The cap's fine. They can figure it out. Uh, <laughs> um. <laughs> But, you know, like they'll do a similar flat structure and you'll see, you know, deals with outs in them after the second year or however long the deal is. Um, and, and yes, anyway, 
I think Hop's a guy they'd be interested in. I, I think they will certainly look in, look into it there. I think maybe Grenard a little bit more just because the measurables and stuff like that. But um, yeah, speed rusher, if Brad Big says it, uh, the, the number one guy there is is Bryce Hoff. All right. And so, and again, what, what, what do you think the contract would have to be in Chicago? Three years, 50. We'll just get, we'll just stick with my projections across the board. And if I'm wrong, we'll all laugh at me later. Three years, 50 million. The problem is, is you rarely are wrong. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, we don't get to laugh very much. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I can bring up some, some demons, some ghosts. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, next priority. Uh, do we want to look at signing a veteran wide receiver? Do we want a pass catching tight end? Do we want a safety? Where do you guys want to look next? How about all three? Well, yeah, I think we're gonna probably, look all three. <laughs> yeah, but all three. I think but we're probably take... going budget for all three, but like of those three, the most expensive would be Brad. Probably, probably. I think it's where they're end, operating, like. I think they'll spend more at safety than they will on a free agent receiver, and then unless it's Noah Fant tight end, like I think. Okay, they're... let's say let's say Noah Fant because he would bring a really nice, you know. I think that lines up pretty nicely with Waldron and and what the Bears need. Mm-hmm. What do you have as a projection for Fant? So we can just throw the number out there. Let's do it. Three three twenty four for Noah Fant. Okay, okay, so you went down. You went down a little bit because I think you were at three twenty seven yep. originally, right? Correct. Yeah. I brought that down. A okay. Yep. And what do you have for the like one of the top safeties, whether it's Blackman or maybe a second tier safety like Whitehead or Jones? The highest safety now uh, is Xavier McKinney, which is at four years, fifty four mil. Uh, and then, and, and you know, Cam Curls, four years, 50. I don't think Kyle Duggar is a guy they're looking into. And no. Winfield's getting tagged. The next tier, it's a big, big drop. You have Geno Stone at two years, 13. Julian Blackman, two years, 11 and a half. Jordan Fuller, two years, nine and a quarter. Like you're talking four to yeah. six mil. Jordan Whitehead's two years, 12 mil. So you're talking two, four to six mil for everybody else that, you, that that is meaningful, you know, after that kind of top cluster, in my eyes at least. I would love a, a combo pack of Fant and either Whitehead or Blackman for those two, and then we can talk about wide receiver where we want to go with that if we want to sign a, a veteran wide receiver. I, I think Fant makes a ton of sense, especially with the Waldron connection. They need a pass catcher. Look, I get trying Robert Tanyan. I understood why they did it. You need a guy that is you know is going to be able to step in and actually catch footballs this year from Caleb Williams. Like that, it, it, you need as many options as possible. They're not going to be able to add a ton of guys. I think Fant makes a ton of sense. I agree there. You know, safety. I, I was definitely one of the Geno Stone guys early. I, I kind of changed that. I know Fuller is the guy that was thrown out there, but I think Blackman makes a lot of sense too. So, Aaron, where would you lean at safety here as we are trying to add? Uh, you know, we've added Noah Fant. I've added him to the list, but where where would you like to add at safety? I think I think I mean really Blackman or Fuller makes sense. I think probably I you almost kind of lean. In, in, I know this happens every year in free agency. You almost lean more in like the familiarity range. I feel like a guy like Blackman obviously was around when Eberflus was there. Uh, I think Eberflus actually drafted him. So, I mean, that could that probably makes the most sense. I mean, I'd be fine with either guy. I think as long as you're going cheaper and you still got some upside and you got that veteran, I, I think it makes a ton of sense. It's a pretty good year to need a like a like a mid range safety. All right, Brad. What is what's the numbers on Julian Blackman? I had two years, eleven and a half mil. Um, I agree. Him and Jordan Whitehead, I think, are two guys I think make sense. C- can play split safety, single high, can, can do a lot of different things, make plays d- down in the box. Um, both of those guys are right around two years 12. So I, I like those those moves. All right. So we will add Julian Blackman uh, and Noah Fant. We have signed them both. Uh, so Blackman, we're doing 212. I'll get that down on the ticker here in a second. I, I think wide receivers, where they have to look next. I know we've got a couple other pieces we want to look at here. But wide receiver, uh, why don't we start with you, Brad, because I don't think we've started with you in a while. What kind of targets do you like at wide receiver here? I think we've mentioned a bunch. I, I think the um, the most intriguing name to me is Curtis Samuel. Has the connection to DJ Moore, uh, which I think is meaningful. I think brings a different skill set. I, I know I mentioned earlier in the show, like a Gabe Davis, because he's, you know, big body can block, which I do think matters in Chicago. Uh, I think it's in part why Darnell Mooney is probably not a bear in 2024, but I think Samuels just still has a lot of potential. Um, I have him at two years, 18, which I think might honestly be too strong. Uh, I haven't got much intel there, but I think it's a pretty strong projection. But 
to me, you do that, and then you're trying to add, you know, outside receivers with your your draft capital that we've that we've talked about. All right, EJ, what about you? Uh, I don't love the Samuel edition, but I don't love the free agent wide receiver core this year. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of great options. Uh, it is really expensive to add a free agent wide receiver these days. It's like adding a free agent left tackle. I mean, you're going to overpay to do it. Um, I think Gabe Davis is going to command a bunch more money than I'm willing to pay him because of that alone. Uh, so Samuel's, uh, I would say... Yeah, for all the reasons that Brad brought up, there are more links there that kind of make sense. I'm not particularly sure that the Bears have to sign one again because the draft is so rich, but the Bears seem to be giving away all the draft picks I might spend on one. <laughs> uh, so, you know, at this point, you got to you got to get it from somewhere. And I don't think Samuel's a bad take. Well, Aaron, Aaron let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I, I, Samuel, I get great possession guy. I get I get, you know, nice outlet for for a rookie quarterback here, but you've got a lot of outlets. I'm not seeing a lot of ability to stretch the field and catch the football. I know Velas and Tyler can stretch the field, but you know, they're more of the feather stone for a necessary roughness uh, that I just, I don't see a lot of field stretching here right now. I like Marquise Brown. I know he's a little more expensive than a Curtis Samuel. I know the fit may not work exactly. Are you a Curtis Samuel guy or do you, you need some more depth in terms of getting some speed and some guys to stretch the field? Well, you know, I'm actually, it, I, I think Samuel makes sense. Um, and Hey, you're talking about Hollywood Brown and I'm an Oklahoma fan. Give me all the Oklahoma <laughs> players. Like I'm, I'm completely fine with that. But the reality of it is, is I, it, at least in the, in the, in the simulations and stuff that I've run, I feel like we're kind of getting to that point where you're starting to, you're almost going to get into spending stupid money if you start handing out, you know, $9 million a year deals, a guy like Curtis Samuel versus maybe going with a guy like a Noah Brown or somebody, a Josh Reynolds, somebody there where you can safely slot him in. It's like a three or a four if need be, but then you can still take a receiver at nine. You can still take a receiver, say in the fifth round, because that was where I had. Uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess the fourth round. And by the way, my chair keeps creaking. I know somebody in the comments is like somebody's farting. I swear to you, it's not. This chair is – I'm sure you've probably seen me go over about three or four times now. Um, this thing is on its last leg, quite literally. So I'm kind of hanging on by a thread here. Uh, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm at a point where as much as I want to feel good about them going into the draft of receiver – I don't know that you're going to get both a guy like Noah Fant and then also a guy like Curtis Samuel. Like, yes, could they do it? They could do it. Will they do it? I don't know that it makes much sense. And then, too, if they got Curtis Samuel, I don't know how comfortable I am with them taking a receiver at nine. Like, I don't know that Ryan Poles is going to feel the need to take a receiver at nine. All right. So are you guys leaning more towards skipping wide receiver right now and, you know, getting someone off the scrap heap in May? Uh, you know, again, I think there's going to be picks down the board that you can look at. There's even going to be some UDFAs just because of the depth of this class. If you want a speedster that's tall, that, you know, doesn't necessarily have a ton of routes that you just want to run on, you know, bank sevens, like there's going to be those guys available. Now the bears don't have late round picks to kind of pick them. They're going to have to win the UDFA battle for them. And that's going to be tougher, but just in terms of this is something we always do in the draft is would you rather have this in the second round and this in the fourth or swap the positions and look at what you get? I would rather have Fant at the tight end position because there's not, again, after those first couple of guys, you're going to be waiting a long time for anybody that's going to have impact at tight end. Whereas all the way down this board, there's wide receivers who you can pick up in the draft. So I would rather spend that free agency money on Fant as a pass catcher and look to the draft for the wide receiver hall. So Brad, Brad, where you want you want to make sure we get a cheap veteran, or do you want to you want to punt this to the draft? I'm cool to punt as well. Um, yeah, like I, I just it's not a good crop, and, and there's no reason to force it. Aaron, are you you agree? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. All right, so I I think now we're we're we've moved on to you know lower priority signings, but still potentially guys that you'd get in wave two here, not not post draft guys. So. Why don't we kind of go around here, all three of you guys, kind of pick a position, pick a guy, and you know we'll get him in the in the mix here. So, Brad, you're you're the free agent expert. You know you got the the board in front of you here. They still haven't signed a any depth at tackle. Uh, they you know 
potentially a running a third running back, a backup quarterback. Where where do you want to spend? What what, what you want? We got. I would say so. Look, we're, we're obviously having this conversation of like, are we getting more pass catchers? Are we getting more protection? I would still add a swing tackle. Um, I, I think it's meaningful, not, not expensive, but I'll, I'll throw out just Cam Fleming. I'll throw him out there. Uh, I have a one year, two and a half million dollar deal. I just want the, the, this front to be, you know, I, I don't think they're going to use premium draft capital after using nine overall or 10 overall, whatever on Darnell last year. Um, we're, we're on the keep Braxton in, in the fold camp, or, or I think me and some people on here are, uh, so yeah, and get, give me a swing tackle, beef that out. Um, and, you know, they probably will get a, a lower tier wide receiver, but I, I liked our conversation of not, not forcing that early on. All right, EJ, who are we signing? You got a guy, who do you want? Uh, I'm going to go backup safety because again, uh, really there's one safety on this roster right now. We just signed Blackman. So there's two, but that's still not enough. Um, I would look at Whitehead if we think that's a reasonable deal. If not, I would drop down to a guy like Brandon Jones, who I really liked coming out of the draft. I look, I know he's a longhorn. Sorry, Aaron, my bad, <laughs> but you know, he's a good player. Yeah, that's fair. You want Brandon See, Jones? I'll take Brandon Jones if we can get him. He should be dirt cheap. Brad, what are we looking at for numbers for Brandon Jones? Yeah, I brand Jones real low. Let me see here. He's yeah. my top 200, though. He's good. I think he's good. Some good tape last year he's with a, our pal Vic Fangio. Under the radar player before the injury. Uh, I really yeah. liked him. They didn't spend a high draft pick on him, so he doesn't come with that pedigree either. I had two years, 6.75 mil total. Yeah. Put him on the Bears for me. I really like the way he plays. Gives them another element in the secondary. They're going to need a third safety. Um, the, the depth in the draft gets interesting it's it's good down to about i would say it's solid down to about 100 and then you're really picking flyers on guys with traits that, that you know are really going to start as special teamers all right um, aaron you're i'm sorry. gonna go yeah i'm gonna go defensive tackle um nothing crazy as much as i want like a christian wilkins or chris jones i mean obviously we're we're well past that uh ej i think it was you that brought up daquan jones dude he has been somebody for me who i have loved since he came out of Penn State um I mean he does have experience with Eric Washington I mean it could make some sense the only downside sure. with him is he's 32 but he's a pretty good player did get hurt last year uh he could make some sense uh, Maurice Hurst can make some sense the other name that keeps standing out to me a little bit is maybe somebody who's kind of like an upside gamble would be Javon Kenlaw now Brad I am curious because mm -hmm. you have him you laughing you have him at one year, five point five million. Is that? Do you th feel like that's? Do you feel like that's a fair projection for him? It's still? certainly a. This guy was a top fifteen draft pick that still has a couple snaps on tape uh, where he moves like a person of his size should not. But it could be, you know, he, his deal could be less than that. He kind of got bumped out of the rotation by like Kevin Givens and some other pieces, but that's juiced up because of pedigree for sure. That's fair. All right, so Aaron. You you've put um, out some guys here. Who who are you signing? Let's go with Jones. I the only problem with Jones is he's at least what Brad has him at. He's got one one year six million. I don't know if that's a little little on the expensive side for depth fees, but we can add him in, figure it out. All right, Daquan Jones. All right, let me add Daquan into here. That way you're not going in, especially with the. I, I know we keep saying it, the lack of picks that they have right now. It's like that way you're not going in trying to force something at defensive tackle. All uh, right. Probably getting an improvement over Justin Jones. All right. I will add my position here, and no one took backup quarterback, so I'm going backup quarterback. You guys mentioned he has been a crush of mine. I would just love him on the Bears for years, uh, ever since he was in Buffalo, and that is Tyrod Taylor. Brad? What would Tyrod Taylor take to sign him as a QB2? Yeah, there's just so many backup quarterbacks at this point that are available on the market. But like I was I was joking earlier, but I also wasn't, that I think he was the, the QB1 in the state of New Jersey last year. Um, I have met two years, nine mil. The game musical chairs can lower these numbers, but he put some good ball on tape, was thrown on the field accurately, um, you know, with velocity, uh, you know, put two years, nine million, and uh, – you know he's been the he's been the the veteran bridge for a lot of good young quarterbacks the last couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, you know in LA when he had the, the punctured lung or whatever before Herbert. But anyway, I, I would love that move. I, I'm a big fan. I, of I'm all for that. I love Tyrod Taylor as a player. I I love what he does whenever he's able to get on the field. 
um could be a real steadying influence for you know presumably you know quarterback at round one pick one all right so we we still have some holes we don't have a a third running back we we made the decision to not sign a veteran wide receiver and i believe that's really the only position we didn't address was running back do we want to wait on running back post draft see if we can get someone uh, in the later rounds, or do you guys have a veteran running back we should bring? <laughs> well, we, we don't have any picks in the later rounds, so that's a trouble. <laughs> but uh, well, I, we, 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 we traded fields, we got we got that we got one back, we, we yeah, got the Bates one, pick back. Yeah, it's still not even in the 200s. Uh, three quick numbers for you, Brad. I'm gonna stress your brain. Uh, Dearness Johnson, minimum. Okay, Craig Reynolds, probably minimum too. Minimum, yeah. Uh, Ty Johnson, also, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> any one of those guys, if we're talking about RB3, uh, they've all had some good tape. Uh, they've all had some decent production. None of them are going to command any money, according to Brad. I'm cool with that. Uh, they're all veterans. Uh, none of them are going to get Caleb killed if they're in there for a couple of third downs. So, I mean, I think we could grab any of those, and they don't really impact our money. So, um, you know, we don't leave it up to chance. I would still bring in some rookies because, look, it's just a it's a fungible position in the NFL. They They get hurt. So. All right. Uh, who, who do you guys want? You, you got EJ. Uh, out of want? those three, I would take Dearness Johnson. It's a good choice. I like Dearness Johnson. He's a good player. He was he was fun. That little stretch in Cleveland that he had. Yeah, he. I. Yeah, I had him marked as my. I did a piece one year about uh, third or later running backs in the order in the NFL who could start on you know, five or 10 teams and yeah. he was on that list. And then the next year he got his opportunity and, and, you know, there's so many of those guys. So it's, it's just a tough position to come into the NFL on because there's a lot of talent that doesn't even get to play. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how about we take another break here? And when we come back, we will start prepping the NFL draft and we will do the draft and wrap this puppy up. Thank you for all you guys that have been sticking with us here. I knew this was going to be a long exercise, but it's a, it's a good one. So when we come back, it is time for EJ Snyder to shine the NFL draft bears banter. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back into the podcast. As we continue this Chicago Bears mock off season, it is time to go to the draft. So we we hear we look at our we look at our free agent acquisitions so far. We filled in a lot of these holes. There were plenty of holes here with the Chicago Bears at this point, but uh, we filled a lot of them with free agency. We did most of it with some, you know, some mid level picks we didn't do a ton of splashes we splashed a little with lloyd cushionberry and bryce huff if those count for you but um obviously we have a ninth pick we've already taken caleb williams one it just has to go through the simulator we already talked about that when we did qb evaluations but wide receiver we still tyler scott is still the second best wide receiver on the roster which is not something you can have going into the 2024 season so you know e ej I know we talk Odunze, we talk neighbors, trading down, we've talked about, you know, yep. get more picks and maybe a Brian Thomas, something like that. What 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 do you think with your expertise with that ninth pick? Well, looking at what we've done, and this is what NFL teams will do. Okay, now we've set our draft board. We just saw the Bears do it live, which is fun to go in and say, now we don't need guard, right? They're going to knock that off because they just traded for one. Teams are going to shuffle their boards. We're going to presume they're going to do this in free agency. It's going to leave us with Caleb Williams at one. At nine, we're going to have to see what the trade options are first because right now, as we sit on this board, we have one, which is Caleb Williams. We have nine, and then we drop all the way to 70. That is a chasm. Now, we have 70 and 75. That's cool, but that gap between nine and 70 is going to see a lot of primary talent go off the board. So if we get some decent trade options at nine and the receivers we want aren't there, I say we definitely look at that trade option. Bottom line, if Odunze is there at nine, I'm you don't get to pick. I'm running that card to the podium all day long. I think he is going to be an all pro wide receiver, not a Pro Bowl wide receiver. I think he's going to be an all pro. So, and the Bears, obviously, with what you said about Tyler Scott, still have a big gaping hole right there, and he would fill it, and we would just be happy all the way to the bank with Caleb and Robe at one and nine and, and go into the rest of our picks to fill the rest of these holes. But I would say, look at the trade options. If the wide receivers are gone, if not, if neighbors or Odunes are there, it's, it's the pick as far as I'm concerned. And then we just look at things like 
three tech, which we're going to see in that 70 to 75 range for sure, or even farther down. We could look at another pick at safety, another pick at wide receiver for sure. I'd say those are probably our primary targets. And then, of course, value shopping, right? Somebody that we don't expect could fall down the board, and we'll take a look at them as they come up. All right, why don't we go, Aaron, Brad, I, I just want to get an opinion on you kind of on this draft, the ninth pick especially, and then obviously, like as EJ said, the gap, because we don't pick again until 70. Uh, oh, there I go, purple. All right, well, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> uh, Aaron, what do you got here for uh, for the draft and, and your strategies? Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm pretty much with what EJ just said, man. If 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 Adunze or neighbors are on the board at nine, you count me in right away. I will figure out the rest later on. It'll be like the uh, it'll be like the the Justin Fields, uh, Tevin Jenkins draft, where you're just like, all right, you know, I can't complain too much about getting to you know two guys you really wanted. So. I think outside of that, yeah, I think you kind of have to work and try to figure out how do you get back into the second round? How are you adding more picks? Like, what are you doing to kind of maximize this draft that you already know is not going to have a ton of top end value outside of, you know, having those two first round picks? Like, you got to find a way to maneuver a little bit and add, you know, a depth piece somewhere uh, while also not sacrificing talent. Because, again, if one of those receivers is on the board at eight, or at nine, I'm I'm taking it, and and you know what, I, I will I'll wait, you know, until the next year to draft if I have to. I don't care. Like that is that's the type of haul that could really start changing things for a team. Brad, anything to add? My bad. I think I just blew my nose into the microphone. Uh, it's getting to be that hour. Um, no, not really, not really. I, I think nine for me that we talked about. Run the receiver pick in. If not, I think they look to trade down. I don't hate the idea of taking a defensive player after the trade down, but I still would, especially in this hypothetical, I'm taking a receiver. All right. So I'm EJ, I'm going to stop sharing here so we can get your draft simulator up and we are going to start drafting. Now we get, just so we know, uh, just so everyone knows here, who's listening, we did talk about the fact that if the draft simulator decides to do something really weird here and Marvin Harrison or something like that is sitting at nine, we are going to reboot. So we are going to try and keep this as accurate as possible. I don't think it's going to happen, but you know, we're going to take Caleb Williams here and see where the cards fall. So EJ, when you are ready to begin, go for it. This is, this is a celebratory moment. Uh, I think this is going to be a great pick, but I said that about Justin Fields. So maybe that's uh maybe that's jinxing it. I don't know. And well, uh, we don't have a receiver on the board. <laughs> we do not have a wide receiver on the board. Wait, so let's where did they go? Real quick. So this right oh, away we went. Harrison, Drake, May, <laughs> so, Neighbors, Odunze. They were gone by five. Like that is that's rugged. I don't think Brock probably goes to the Giants, but again, Quinion Mitchell, I can see going very high. He was, you know, my corner two. He had a very good combine. Um, Byron Murphy. Now that does leave some people that we didn't expect on the board. Joe Alt is yeah, still there. See, that, that, now here's where I sit here with Joe Alt and go. I, I said I want to go with Braxton Jones, but Joe Alt is sitting here at nine, and this throws a total wrench in. That. Yeah, both of the top tackles are still on the board. Alt and Fashano uh, are fashion are both there. Uh, yeah, Brock, Brock went early. So again, and this is. This is actually pretty useful because this is a scenario I want to get Bears fans used to is that right now everybody's like, oh, nine, we're taking receiver. We're, we're, we're taking an offensive option, right? And a lot of the mock drafts I run, the offensive option you want at nine is not there. Now, we have zero trades up on the board. Nobody you know, is ostensibly saying they want to trade for nine. I think that's a very realistic scenario, except for the tackles being there. Somebody would want alt. I get that. Uh, you know, I would say in this case that's probably the move is to trade away the pick for alt and you know a potential again pro bowl tackle uh goes to somebody else but it's not really a thing you need it's the best value on the board for sure but i know other people say that but then we're going to go all the way to 70 and 75 and a lot of those primary wide receivers you want to get are going to be gone so I'll leave it up to you. This, I don't think there's a clear choice here. There is not a player on the board right now that I'm like, oh, that's the pick because the guys I want at nine are gone. And I think that's a fairly realistic scenario. It might be other players, but I think Odunze and neighbors are going to be gone at nine. All right. I'm going to propose an idea here with this situation. It. The New York Jets are going to take an offensive lineman. They need to protect Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Would you want to potentially look at trading down to 10? 
just grabbing a, a pick here sure. to let the Jets come up and get the top tackle, then potentially trading down because Jaden Daniels has not been selected. Uh, now, I, I know, obviously, with the simulator, we can't uh, you know decide exactly who's going to come up, but I look at this and go, let the Jets come up and take all, then trade down to someone who wants to come up for a quarterback and, and takes Jaden Daniels at 10. We get some draft capital and we can get a, you know, that next level wide receiver. I'm the bears fine. trading from I'm nine to 10. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Sounds Doesn't familiar. it? <laughs> uh, so is that the play? Is that what we're going to do? We're going to trade with the jets. Let's trade with the jets. Okay. Let's trade with the jets. All right. Jets. We're going to take 10. They get nine. Brad, what's fair compensation for that on their side? They well, last, have... year was a, last year was the fourth round pick a late fourth from the Eagles. So, so that's like 144, 187. That's, those are our choices. Do 144. 144. Okay, so 10 and 144 come to us. They come up one spot. We get 144 for three. That means we have 140, 143, and 144. We're going to have Love fun it. in that section of the draft. Love it. We're going to make some hay. Okay, it looks like that'll be accepted. We're going to offer that trade so that they can lock in alt. Presumably, we would have multiple offers for that. They indeed take alt, so the simulator's working. Congratulations, Brad. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, we are looking at largely the same board we were looking at before, minus uh, alt. Uh, let's just take a quick look at that wide receiver board and see who is there. That means Troy Franklin at 24, Brian Thomas at 29, Lad McConkey 33-ish, Adonai Mitchell uh, or Adonai Mitchell at 37, Keon Coleman at 39. All options of those, my favorite two are Thomas and McConkey, but they are going to be available a little bit farther down this board. So if we're looking at a second trade for a potential Jaden Daniels host, who do who do we think down well, the board we might take a shot at? Team sitting at 13 and make sure he doesn't go to Minnesota yeah. makes like hey, more sense. Okay, Raiders for, for Jaden Daniels. Let's just say it's for Jaden Daniels. Um, all right, let's do another trade with the Raiders. Uh, we're going to go down to the Raiders pick. All right, so we're going to give them 10. They're going to give us 13. Brad, what's the number? Three, and maybe get a little bit of a QB, uh... a QB upgrade. So our choices are 113 or 147. There's a bit of a gap there. Just You don't think they can get a... You know they can get seventy-seven. Oh, I guess that's for a not a, three for a yeah, three-round swing a very, outside the top ten. It, yeah, I that's mean, not a very yeah. Simulator might. Let's see what the simulator says. Simulator, uh, they said ninety-five percent chance for seventy-seven. Yeah. Does seem a little bit awesome. Awesome. So whatever the simulator says is what the NFL does. <laughs> All right, so I'll take seventy-seven for free. That gives us. <laughs> we're gonna have two runs here. We're gonna go seventy, seventy-five, seventy-seven, and. Like 140, 142, and 143. I love it. I, said. So I love it. That's we got, all right. Like. We're going we're we're to offer that up. Form. We're going to say that the Raiders uh, take Jaden Daniels or or really whoever they want. Um, let's see. Now nah, they take Cooper DeGene, of course. Jared Verse goes off the board. So now still got tackles on the board, some high corners. Closest edge rusher is Dallas, Dallas Turner. Turner yeah. Not so in man. love with that. But now we have two trade offers at 13. Um, let's see. We got the Rams at 19, or we got the 49ers at 31. I wouldn't do that. I would look at the Rams at 19, though, because I still think we're going to get one of the wide receivers we want. Nobody's picked Nobody's picked up any of those wide receivers, and there's at least two potential targets in, in McConkey or Thomas. I would take Thomas. Um, again, looking for a straight outside wide receiver, but what do you say about trading down with Los Angeles to get into 19? <laughs> I mean, I'm not opposed. I, I want to try and keep this in the realm of re realism. I, I I do too. So we could just pick a wide receiver here. We could make Brian Thomas go off the board, presumably a little bit early. He had a very good yep. combine. All right. Let's just do Brian Thomas off the board at 13. Everybody will moan. Bears will get their wide receiver. Caleb gets his target. He ran a 4 3 3 at 6 4. It's, I, he, he, might, he might go this early, people. <laughs> all right. So we're just going to take Brian Thomas to keep this in the realm of possibility and not hoard all the picks like Scrooge McDuck. But uh, all right. Brian Thomas becomes a bear. And now we get a pretty long stretch to 70. We'll see. A, that, there goes Graham Barton. Uh, let's see. I'm waiting for the other centers to go. Jaden Daniels doesn't go until 31. That's Zach crazy. Frazier, first pick of the second round. So, again, if you think you're going to get one of those high centers down in the 40s, that's not going to happen. Where'd J.J. McCarthy end up going? 
Uh, we'll figure it out in just a second when it slows down. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Oh, Malachi Corley goes off the pick before. That is a bummer. I would have liked to have that's him. That's a disaster. Yeah, that's that, a disaster. That, is, that is not great. We would have loved to have him. Uh, so, Mikey Sinistra. Let's see where JJ ends up. Roman, JJ 40. is at 42 <laughs> to the Vikes. Oh, boy. That would be something. Uh, right. Penix goes right after him to the Falcons. Bo Nix goes right after him to the Raiders. So, 40, yeah, how about that? so it's, it's, JJ's going top 10, but I do think the next two quarterbacks is is more realistic of where I think their range is actually going to be. Yeah, again. So, you'll have to correct the simulator after we're done, Brad. Uh, all right, can, so now yeah. we are at 70. We have a run of picks here. We have 70, 75, and 77. They're all sitting right there. Um, let's take a spin. I'm not really going to look at trades right off. Let's see who's left at wide receiver. So Johnny Wilson's there. Not really interested in him. Xavier yeah. Leggett is absolutely yeah. a possibility at 74. Jamari Thrash, 75. Some people like Brendan Rice. And then we drop down to like the 100 level wide receivers and Jacob Cowing. I would consider Xavier Leggett with this pick or the next, probably this one, to make sure we wanted to get him. Um, tight end, I want to take a quick look at that. You know, also, we're want to take a look at defensive tackle, too. Yep. We're going to get down into the defensive positions next. I think we're probably going to skip interior offensive line because of the trade the Bears just made. We're going to get down, take a look at defensive line. Okay, Dorless is there at 79, Sweat at 90. I'm really interested in this 100 range because Dwayne Carter and Leonard Taylor are two penetrating three techs that I think the Bears could really benefit from. I think Eberflus would love them. We might take one of them with 77 just to get the one we want um, because they do tend to go off right before the 111 pick that we currently hold. Um, they tend to get drafted just a little bit earlier. So if we want to secure one with 77, but that leaves us 70 and 75. Um, I'm going to take a look at Edge real quick and see who's on that roster. Ooh, Austin Booker. I like Austin Booker. I think he's Marshawn Nealand's there too. Yeah, I like Marshawn Nealand and Booker of of who's there. So we could do some combo platter here of uh, like Xavier Leggett, uh, Booker or Nealand, and then Carter or um, Leonard Taylor from from Miami, and we would have three major assets that all plug into holes that the Bears could fill. Sign me up. I would say Leggett or Booker for me. Um, either one's a good pick. Okay, I would say Leggett because he's yeah. at the top and we there's a drop-off after him, whereas we could get Marshawn Nealon with the next one. We don't necessarily love the wide receiver we get if we don't take Leggett and he goes off the board. Yep, I agree. All right. All right. So we'll do Leggett at 70. Pretty close to value. Currently valued at 74. Bill sponsored by the Blair Witch Project. Is that an official sponsor? Or <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, guess what? You can still have Booker. He did not come off the board. Uh, he is currently the third best player listed on the board. So it's either Booker or Nealon for me. I really like Booker's athletic upside, but I said that about Dominic Robinson too, if we want to pile on. So uh, no, I like Booker. He's an explosive athletic pass rusher. If they're looking for speed, Again, with what Brad said, you know, put him behind Huff and, and you know, teach him how to eat. I'm fine with that. Um, do we want to go edge or we want to look at some other position? I think we should go edge. I, I, I think, think I think taking Booker makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's so best, best value on the board. Booker at 75. I am not sad about that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Jalen Wright, the running back from Tennessee, goes off in the pick in between. And now we're looking at – uh, we could pick up a safety. We're starting to get into the realm of safety, but we've signed two already. So I would really look at that three tech position because I like both of those players. I think they're probably a little bit undervalued on the board right now. I know they're way down there. If we wait to 111, we could potentially lose both of them. We might pick up Taylor, but I think Carter goes before that. So three tech is a position that we know it was the first potential free agent signing when Eberflus and Poles were paired together. They tried to go get Larry Ogajobi, and it feels like they've been chasing that ever since. I'm definitely okay with adding a three tech. As you know, I, I want more with Dexter and obviously, you know, you're not getting any sure things at this point in the draft, but I am definitely on board going that direction. 
All right, coin flip, Brad. Would you rather have Carter or Taylor? They're slightly different, but they offer a lot of the same upside. I would vote Dwayne Carter personally. Taylor, like, was a guy that I thought coming into the year could have, you know, really boosted his stock. I, well, I just, his interesting thing about Taylor is they ended up having to play him out of position because Miami lost a one tech like two weeks before the season. They said, "Hey, can you put on twenty pounds?" And he did not look good doing it. He is a pure three tech. But I'm with you. I like Dwayne Carter. I think he'd be a great addition with the current Bears lineup. He would add something that they don't have. Um, we're just. We're going to go a little bit early. The simulator is going to kill us. It's going to say he took up 30 picks too early, but it's not really relevant to us because if we wait to 111, I bet he would have been off the board. So we'll take Dwayne Carter with 77. Add that penetrating three tech. Has some flexibility to play one in NASCAR packages as well. He's done that. All right. Now we're on our slide all the way down to 111. Seeing a bunch of good players go off the board. And now it kind of feels like we're playing with house money. We need another wide receiver for sure. Um, uh, Leonard Taylor's still there at 110 for the, you know, 111. Um, Max Melton. Got, it's not a bad yeah, Max value. Melton's great. Uh, Dadrian Taylor Demerson, Rabbit, guy we interviewed at the Shrine Bowl. Love him. He's got some nickel versatility, also can play free safety. Um, let's see what the wide receiver board looks like because we know we still have need there. Javon Baker, uh, right about at value. And we're coming up on one of my favorite players in the draft, Malik Washington. Um, and Taj is still there at, at 150. If we go down the board, he was he's obviously already familiar with Caleb. Makes a lot of plays on USC tape if you see that. So we have some options at wide receiver. Um, are there other positions that you guys want to look to bolster? Um, not just on value, but in terms of like adding a backup center, adding a corner another safety another tight end anything it's kind of but, thinking corner for me corner corner and probably another receiver would make make sense to me yeah i think hopefully i mean whatever let's take a look at on a db in there makes a lot of sense or you could look at offense i highly doubt there's gonna be very many offensive tackles available but uh we could look and see if they still have a swing probably would have been a good thing well christian jones is still there like yeah. he would he's a great mm -hmm. developmental player i'd I'd be fine with that if we really think uh, that we're not super happy with who we added in free agency. I mean, Cam Fleming's fine, but if we want to put in a better – and it does drop off for me really down to about Javon Foster, which is at 161. Uh, I'm going to take a quick look at safety, even though we added some low price free agents because, yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of depth at safety. Those top four safeties are all players I'd be comfortable with. Um, and, and I would just say that – We've, you know, just kind of looking at the depth chart here. I know we don't have that up. We'll bring that up once the draft concludes. Yeah. There, we, we are definitely in a BPA situation. There is not like, there is not a glaring hole here where you're like, you could nice. really get some depth here. So, uh, obviously, right, so we don't have a fifth wide receiver, but, uh, you know, we talked about maybe running back. We've talked about some things, but the, there's not some, a glaring hole still on. Cool. The All right. BPA, I would, if, I mean, I know we said corners really stacked. Renardo Green's a great player. We could grab Green, Taylor, or one of the safeties. Um, you know, I don't know that we need a backup center in Cedric Van Pram, but it's, you know, the rich getting richer wouldn't be bad. I'm, I'm good with corner. I At, at this point, I, I go to your expertise. This is not All right. Drink. Cool. Um, <laughs> I think... Of the players that are on the board in terms of the highest upside, Renardo Green is a great outside corner. We got to interview him at Shrine. He's a tremendous player. Love his mindset. Love his makeup. He's got a really good frame. And then Leonard Taylor is another penetrating three-tech. And again, if you're looking for just boosting pass rush, we now have a free agent outside edge. We have a rookie edge. We've got a rookie three-tech already. Um I'd say it's probably between Green and one of the safeties because both of those guys are going to be able to play special teams. Max, I was at the end of the long jump when Max did his 11-4. I actually got that on camera. Like that's and he he jumped vertically, I think 40 and a half. So he's super explosive. Yes, it is Bo Melton's brother, by the way. Um, so I would say Renardo, just on pure value, like and and just, look, I'm just going to look at big picture here. I would say Renardo Green because let's just yep. say Jalen Johnson plays the year on the tag, and they can get the deal done. They may all right, let him Renardo go. Green. It is. I am again not sad about that in any way. This is lining up pretty nicely. Whenever we have picks, there's players we really like. 
Um, doesn't always work like that in the draft, certainly. Uh, 123. Now I think it's time to probably go back to wide receiver. Leonard Taylor, interestingly, is still there. Or the other thing we could do is look at backup running back. But let's see. Oh, Malik's there. I going to have a lot of trouble yeah. not saying Malik. Yeah. Malik Washington makes a ton of sense there. Yep. Okay, I think Malik is Poor there. Luke. I'm, I'm going to check. Luke McCaffrey is also a guy that I want in the fifth. Okay. But I think it's too early. It's too early to go for. So that's yeah, fine. yeah. Washington. We might, great. we might steal Trey Benson at 140. Like, and if we do that, if we do Malik and steal Trey Benson at 140, we're we're cooking with gas. Like, yeah. we're all kinds of good. All right, uh, Malik, it is. It's a little bit early. The simulator will kill us, but he is a tremendous player. I I think he's one of the most bust-proof wide receivers in this entire draft, so not sad at all that former UVA who, Malik Washington, becomes a bear. He gets to keep wearing blue and orange. He's already fully comfortable in those colors. Uh, interesting, Taj Washington goes off the board. Uh, we get down into some other wide receivers. Did we lose? We did lose Trey Benson. Isaac Rendo's there. It's a little bit early for him or Dylan Johnson. Again, look at all these, look at all these backs. You, this is the, this is the leverage against free agent running backs is them looking down the board and going, I can get Isaiah Davis at 225. I don't have to pay you any money. Um, so that's, again, that's just illustration for the folks watching along at home. All right. Is there a value at tight end? Ooh, Dallin Holker's still there. I like him. I also like Jaheim Bell, and we have a pick that we could use on him a little bit later. This is it. This is our last run. 140, 143, 144. We are out before 150 with a ton of picks. Um, start thinking about who you might want to grab regardless of value just because there aren't, there aren't any more picks. I like one of those, one of these tight ends with one of the three picks I do like. Okay, I think we probably picked Jaheim Bell for me with the very last pick because he is explosive. He is a – if he put him under Fant, like Holker I really like. Team captain, tremendously athletic, made a tremendous catch at the combine, but he also made a couple of tremendous catches during the season. Um, oh, yeah. Great, great player either way. Um, what about the linebacker? Can I interest you in a really good puncher? Uh, maybe. I, I would give you 143 for – punter that i just can't even say that with a straight face ah. <laughs> um rosen there at 187 we oh. can take him oh, man, yeah that's because we didn't take christian jones i would i would be down yeah, with that. Gotta be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all gotta right be so uh 143 is probably going to be uh shaheen bell rosen 144 what do we do at 140 uh let's see if there's a great safety left again well bo braid's really good um it's weird having like extra picks right before 150. It's usually down in the 200s of the 225s running back. I'd say we pick up, um, who back of quarterback? And not really. Uh, all right, let's. I don't know. 140 is kind of up for is there any? Ooh, we could pick up Zach Zinner and just have guards all over the place. That'd be fun. Anybody on the defensive line has a rush threat because you can never have too many pass rushers. Um, Makai Wingo, I like a little bit. Uh, any edges? Oh, Xavier Thomas. His, oh, man. Hmm. I don't know. I think you could basically line up three of these guys and roll. Yeah, them I, think we're just, three, I think we're probably just going to blast. Yeah, I'll take a, we haven't minutes. even looked at linebacker yet. Oh, you wanted a punter. Oh, I'm with you. sorry. I'm We're taking no, you're good. Great. Yeah, you got you got you got all sorts of options there. I'm good with whatever. All right. We're gonna go uh Cedric Gray because he's probably the highest option linebacker. He's just a special teamer for us right now. We're gonna go get uh Jaheim Bell as our, you know, he can play a little bit of fullback, he can play a little bit of you know, tight end three, whatever. And then Roger Rosengarten as our developmental tackle, and we are going to laugh all the way to the bank. That's our last pick is one forty four. That's sick. That's crazy. I love it. All right, let me work on updating the depth chart here, and then we will give final thoughts on this off season. Yeah, I'll just prepare, folks. The grade is not going to be great because we took players we liked at positions before they were going to drop off the board, but we we grabbed a lot of really good talent here. This is a if anything like this were to come to pass for Chicago, 
they would be approaching next season with a much improved roster. And we didn't even really go overboard in free agency, like made a couple of big splashes and then filled in some gaps and then just let the board come to us in the draft, traded down a couple of times for extra picks with, we tried to keep it realistic in terms of value. Like we have our, we have our draft expert here. He didn't, it's not like he didn't write a book on it. <laughs> All right. I think I updated everything on here as I tried to keep up. I did not update the ticker. So we're just, that's gonna, okay. You're not going to keep up on the ticker. All right. Okay. So it starts off early because we went for Brian Thomas early, but that set us up for success in the rest of the draft. Caleb pick gets an A plus. Brian Thomas gets a C just because it was early, not because he's a C-rated player. Xavier Leggett gets a B plus. Austin Booker an A, very nice. Dwayne Carter C again. We reached for him probably twenty or thirty picks early, but we liked the player and we didn't want him to disappear. Bernardo Green a deep A. Malik Washington a B plus. Cedric Jaheim and Roger Rosengarten were just picking players that we liked with our last three picks. So value wise, it's not great. Still come out with an A minus and a ton of good players. All right. All right. Yeah, Bill, let's see that death chart. See where we're at. All right. Let's, uh, this chair almost went out on me again. <laughs> we got to get a GoFundMe for Aaron's chair. <laughs> dude. Between I, Aaron's I, chair and my my camera. Uh, oh, dude. Yeah. I think actually talk to me after, Bill. I might have a spare webcam that doesn't do that. <laughs> All right. Bear's depth chart. Let's open this puppy up. And here we go. All right, so this is what the roster is looking like right now. Obviously, there's a couple guys in, in the wrong spots, but, you know, you, you get the point here overall. So, um, obviously, Bears now super young with their depth at wide receiver. Uh, they filled, you know, plenty of tackles. Larry Borum's not making this roster anymore. Depth that, you know, Ryan Bates also going to back up Lloyd Cushenberry. And, you know, plenty of depth on the defensive line now. We even added a, a special teams linebacker. Plenty of depth at wide receiver. Safety is serviceable. It's certainly not going to knock your socks off. It's not going to be the strongest position on the team this year. But uh, let's go around the room. Brad, take a look at the depth chart. What do you think? I think we are looking at a Super Bowl champion Chicago Bears 2025 <laughs> roster here. No, I think we were realistic. You know, I think we really didn't make any major splashes in free agency, but addressed obvious needs, filled out the roster. Gave us flexibility in the draft to go. I guess maybe we didn't go BPA. We kind of forced receiver a little bit, but um, yeah, no, I, I think it's it's Super Bears Super Bowl. Uh, Aaron, what do you got? Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't see any reason why this team couldn't be a playoff team this coming year. Obviously, a lot of it would have to do with Caleb Williams, but I think on paper this is a better better team than what they had last year. I think the offensive line gets better. Obviously, you add a little bit more depth on the offensive line. Um, Defensive tackle is probably not exactly what you want, but I think there's at least some there, – there's a little bit of upside there, but I like the edge rusher a lot better than I liked it coming into this last season. So, I I mean, that's there's no reason that can't be, you know, an 8, 9, 10 win team. And EJ, what do you think? Uh, obviously, it starts with Caleb, but with the combination of free agency in the draft, which is really what you're looking for. You're looking at a much improved offensive line. You're looking at a much – you know, the potential of a much improved receiving core, uh, both now and for the future. Again, not all these picks are going to pan out. They never do. There are way more weapons for defensive firepower in terms of pass rush, both through free agency and the draft, which I love that combination because, again, you have free agency busts just like you have draft busts. But here you've got backups that can hopefully step into those roles, develop and play. And, you know, you just grabbed some freebies down the board. Dwayne Carter at 77 like he's a potential starting three tech in the league renardo green after 100 any of those outside corners go down we've seen what happens when the secondary gets injured renardo green is a potential starter at outside corner you basically stole him after 100 um guys down the board that can contribute in role play and again build towards that 2025 season with some experience uh, caleb's not going to be short of protection or weapons and that's really what i care about the most after the fact that he's on the bears and and that's to me, I, I'm looking at this and the additions to the defense are nice. I look at this at, at the quarterback position with Caleb Williams. What have we done for Caleb Williams? We've brought in a savvy veteran in Tyrod Taylor who's been around the league, knows what he's doing. 
they've got a solid running game. I think it's not, not going to knock your socks off, but it's a solid running game. A lot of options at wide receiver. Maybe all three of them don't pan out, but a good chance two of them do, which is all they're going to need. And not to, you know, obviously address the center position, which was important, but there is so much depth on this offensive line now that has been not the case. So I'm really pleased with this, this draft and free agency. I think we did a good job combining it. And again, this is, you know, the last thing I'll say is this is kind of what we've talked about. We all want Roma Dunze at nine. I, yeah, every, everyone's saying it, but there is a chance that those three guys move off the board. And what do they do then? Trade down. And again, look at the lack of picks the Bears had coming into this and the amount of picks they had coming out with Ryan Pace doing a uh, Ryan Poles doing a double trade. Ryan Pace would never know. <laughs> Ryan <laughs> Poles doing a double trade down in the first round. So Aaron, EJ, Brad, thank you so much. The audience that has stuck with us for two and a half hours, thank you so much for those of you who watch this live start to finish. And of course, if you're checking this out on the podcast, a lengthy one of that as well. Thank you very much. We'll be back with more Bears banter. Of course, catch all of Brad's stuff on Pro Football Focus. Make sure you're catching EJ on bootleg. Make sure you catch all of Aaron's stuff on Bear Report and Windy City Gridiron. Thank you to all of you. Bear down, everybody. Let's see what happens here in the next couple of weeks. Big, big offseason for the Chicago Bears. Adios.